I am lead administrative law judge Sarah Hosey. Uh, we met at the pre-hearing conference on April 5th, but with me today are panel members Judge Shireen Reidenauer and Judge Josh Lambert. Um, the Office of Tax Appeals will be conducting today's hearing uh, electronically, as you all know, um, with the agreement of all parties and participants. Also present is our stenographer, uh, Ms. Alonzo, who will be reporting this hearing verbatim. To ensure we have an accurate record, we ask that everyone speak one at a time and not speak over each other. Also speak clearly and loudly. When needed, Ms. Alonzo will help the hearing process and ask for clarification. After the hearing, Ms. Alonzo will produce the official hearing transcript, which will be available on the Office of Tax Appeals website. So today's proceedings will also be live streamed as you heard earlier. Uh, we, the transcript and the video recording um, are part of the public record and will be posted on the website um, under hearings. During today's hearing, OTA asks that you please say your name before you speak. Please do not use the chat feature in WebEx. Please mute your microphone if you are not speaking to avoid feedback and background noise. Please note that these proceedings are being broadcast live and any information shared on the screen is publicly viewable. If there's any questions during the process, including any questions regarding technology, please direct them to me. If you become disconnected or have technical difficulties, please wait and we will contact you. So we'll go, um, right now we're off the record. I'm gonna do a bit of review. We're gonna go over the witness order. We'll answer any questions. Um, so we're all on the same page. And then when we go on the record, that's when um, our stenographer, Ms. Alonzo, will begin transcribing. If at any time you're confused as to the process or have any questions, just let me know. So I'm the lead judge for conducting this hearing, but all the judges on the panel are co-equal decision makers. We have all read the briefs, examined the exhibits, and the joint statement of facts. The issue I have to be decided in this appeal is whether Mr. Beckwith was a California domiciliary and or resident on, on December 19th, 2012, when he exchanged his shares in Eco Energy Holdings, Inc. This was agreed upon in the pre-hearing conference minutes and orders issued on April 7th. All right, so the exhibits we have, we discussed at the pre-hearing conference, appellants uh, one through three and respondents A through V, and admitted them into the record via the pre-hearing conference minutes and orders issued on April 7th. We do have some new exhibits, so let's go over those. FTB submitted exhibits W through AC. Mr. Horowitz, do we have any objections to those exhibits? Um, no, Your Honor. Okay. Though there is one thing, Your Honor, in exhibit Z, which are legal bills. I believe they were submitted to show the dates that Mr. Um, Beckwith was involved in the purchase of, in negotiating the purchase of property on West 5th Street in Los Angeles and then there are, that's through page 902 and pages, or 901, two, one, and then pages 902 through 905 do not deal with that matter. So we'd object to those pages of exhibit Z as being irrelevant. Z pages uh, one or 901 through what was it? Sorry, the second number through nine. 905. No, it's 902 through 905. Sorry, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Hostel, do you have a response to the objection? Exhibit Z. The invoices, pages 902 through 905. I, th I think for purposes of our, our discussion today, my focus is going to be on, on page 902. 
uh, one of the allegations that um, uh, Mr. Beckwith um, makes is that he had uh, much of his bill sent to his, his mother's home. Um, here is a bill on page 902 dated September 13th, 2012, where the bill was actually sent to his West 5th Street address. And I think it's, it's important to uh, rebut any allegations that um, he wasn't using uh, the West 5th Street address for mail purposes. But as far as the billings and stuff and like that, I don't, I don't have an issue with that. But but but, but 902 would be um, uh, a very re the relevant document. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and no. allow it. I'll overrule the objection. Thank you, Mr. Horowitz. Um, we'll keep it relevant in the argument and we'll keep in mind uh, the point of contention. Um, do you have any other documents that you're planning to admit today, Mr. Horowitz? No, Your Honor. Okay. We do have joint exhibits J1 through J20, as well as the joint statement of facts, and we'll enter those into the record shortly as well. Okay, as for the order of the hearing, um, as we discussed at the preparing conference, we have 15 minute openings, and then we are planning on having Mr. Beckwith go first for the appellant. Um, I wanna remind you that we each have two and a half hours for the presentation of your own witness and to cross-examine the other parties' witnesses. We're really short on time. We just have this afternoon and tomorrow morning. And with everything we have to get through plus breaks, it's I'm really gonna have to keep um, close eye on time. I have timers for each of you so that I'll be able to track it and we'll, you know, I was gonna split it up, but I really wanted you each to have your own control of your own strategy. So I figure this is the most fair way to do it. We will be um, taking a break about two hours in, um, just so we can have um, Ms. Alonzo take a break and then we'll all come back. But I want to remind you to leave the WebEx open for the break, just turn off your camera and uh, mute your microphone. That way we'll just keep this running and we'll come back 15 minutes after we break. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, who were you planning to have af to call after Mr. Um, Beckwith? Can you hear me, Mr. Horowitz? Yes, I was. I my mic was muted, and oh, I was trying okay. to unmute it. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, my mic was muted, and I was trying to unmute it. Um, we were going to call Chadwick Khan, C O N N. Mr. Khan is in the Central Standard Time Zone, and he indicated a preference to be called after work sometime between four o'clock either four or four thirty pacific time and then benjamin walker who asked to be called probably around five o'clock okay we can see how um the rest of the testimony and the cross go but i will after mr beckwith we can see if we're past the four o'clock mark um, I'm leaving time for the judges to have questions too. And then I'm guessing, Jody, yes, if, go ahead. If I may, I don't really see how that time frame for Mr. Khan and, and, and Mr. Martin is really going to work. I mean, you know, I would say that of the four witnesses, the person I'll be examining the longest is going to be Mr. Cohn. Um, so I don't really see a direct and cross exact uh, and cross in a in a half hour. Um, you know that you know my my suggestion would, would be for 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 them to maybe contact their witnesses and see about being available earlier and maybe doing Mr. Bet Bet Beckworth afterwards. But because of the nature of our per presentation, is we're ending at six and then we're starting again at 9 30 in the morning and i don't know if they're going to be available that early or not so you know i just want to make sure that you know we have our ample opportunity to 
cross-examining and in the narrow window that Mr. Horwitz is representing that these witnesses are going to be available. I just don't see that 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 happening. Um, but I, you know, I, I just want to have have that out there that maybe you know the the thought process of when and where and who's available, um, you know, just needs to possibly be you know revisited behind the scenes and seeing if maybe these witnesses are available. Um, but I don't really see even Mr. Beckworth being, you know, uh, his his cross-examination be, being finished by, you know, 5.30 or 6, to be honest, honest and with you. So, just something to think about is, is is you know, that's just a, a, a concern on ours. I, I tried to mention earlier, but I was on mute and didn't they know it with regards to the joint exhibits. Um, there was one exhibit um, and it's J19. It's actually two exhibits in one. And I just wanted to bring that to uh, the panel's attention that um, that um, uh, it's, it's at page 2858, that that's actually um, two documents and that are, 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 are inconsistent with, with, with each other. I apologize for bringing it up late, but I was on mute and I was talking and <laughs> I couldn't get through, so I, I apologize. So, as for the timing, I mean, we just have the time that we have. Right. Um, Mr. Horowitz, are Mr. Khan and Mr. Walker available tomorrow morning, or is this the only um, time Mr. Fall? Walker, I know for sure, is available tomorrow morning. He indicated to me that if need be, he could be available at 9 or 9.30. I can Pacific time. I will email Mr. Khan to see if he would be available tomorrow morning. And if so, what are the best times to reach him? Okay, he might have to do that, especially if we have Mr. Khan this afternoon as well. Um, we'll just have to play it by ear a little bit and um, see what we get through. I mean, we only have, you know, the, se the seven and a half hours schedule. Everything else is booked. So we'll have to um, do our best to fit it within that time frame. As to exhibit J19, I'm pulling up the exhibits now. I have page one is a check issue, check number, and then Page two, you're saying should be. Sorry, Except I don't have a page two. No, 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 I don't no. either. On, on the same page, there's two, and there's two exhibits on the same page. Oh, I see. So the bottom half, the detached stub, is right. that's not the stub. That's something different. Yeah, that the bottom oh, the stub top is not related is... to the first part. Yeah. Correct. The do, first, um, the top part. J19A and J19B, since it's already labeled. Yeah. And then that way, if you want to reference it for your argument or for your witnesses, let's do J19A, the top half of the page, and then J19B is the bottom half of the page. Thank you for clarifying. I thought that was the detached stub. So, yeah. okay. All right, we'll just get through as much as we can. Um, we have, you know, I doubt we'll get to the arguments or the closing, so I'll leave that open for tomorrow, but that is still in the plan. Um, do I have any other questions before we get this going? I want to try and get as much time as we can in here. Seeing no questions, let's go on the record. This is the appeal of David Beckwith, case number 2005-6187. Today is April 26, it's 1.14 p.m. This hearing is being held virtually via WebEx with the consent of the parties. I am lead administrative law judge, Sarah Hosey, and with me today is Judge Shireen Reidenauer and Judge Josh Lambert. Can I have the parties please state your names for the record, starting with appellant? David Beckwith. Thank you, Mr. Robert Beckwith. Sir. Go ahead, Mr. Horwitz. Robert Horwitz, appearing for Mr. Beckwith. Good 
Mr. Barron, appearing for Mr. Beckwith. Can I have respondent FTB make their appearances? Uh, Ron Hofstel for the Franchise Tax Board. Desiree Macedo with the Franchise Tax Board. Thank you. The issue to be decided in this appeal is whether Mr. Beckwith was a California domiciliary and or resident on December 19th, 2012, when he was exchanged his shares in Eco Energy Holdings, Inc. We pre-marked exhibits one through three for appellant and A through V for respondent FTV at the pre-hearing conference held on April 5th, 2022. They were admitted into the record per the pre-hearing conference minutes and orders issued on April 7th, 2022. We have new exhibits to enter into the evidence today. The Franchise Tax Board um, submitted exhibits W through AC. Um, we are entering exhibits W through AC are admitted into evidence into the record. We also have a joint statement of facts signed by both parties, along with joint exhibits J1 through J20. We noted that J exhibit J19 has been split into two exhibits, J19A and J19B. We are now entering, um, admitting these as evidence into the record. I want to remind before we call our first witness, I want to encourage the witnesses to testify in a narrative form for efficiency. For efficiency. Um, the question and answer can be very time consuming and I want them to be very focused and relevant. Keeping in mind the panel has reviewed the briefing exhibits and the joint statement of facts. All right, Mr. Beckwith, are you ready for your testimony? I'm going to swear you in first. Yes, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Horowitz. I'm sorry. Were we going to have opening statements? Oh yeah, let's do that. <laughs> uh, also, Your Honor, I had one question on the conference minutes and order. It lists after testimony two and a half hours each, presentation thirty minutes each, and then closing. And from my understanding based on the OTA's booklet on evidentiary hearings, the presentation is submitting documents and calling witnesses. And I was wondering if the presentation was something other than that, or if it was a, something different. No, that's your, that's your, your legal argument. Um, so whatever, um, using whatever facts and documents and testimony that you've presented, that's your time to provide the legal argument and connect it for us. Is that okay, then, your question? Yes, because then there was also, after that, it was closing remarks, 10 minutes each with re rebuttal. And was that different than closing? It doesn't have to be, you can use it however you like. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. All right, um, was there another question before we were going to do opening statements? Seeing none, Mr. Horowitz, would you please begin your opening presentation or your opening um, statements, please? Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the panel, um, Mr. Hofstel, Ms. Mikado. Um, the case involves whether David Beckwith was a resident of California on December 19th, 2012. By way of background, Mr. Beckwith was born in California and in 1990, approximately, he married Erica Mikado, who had a young daughter, Kyla. Um, his, in 1997, his brother Larry had founded a company in Nashville, Tennessee, I mean, in Franklin, Tennessee, which is a suburb of Nashville called Echo Energy. At that time, Echo Energy um, was engaged in the business of buying ethanol from manufacturers and selling the ethanol to oil companies. And in 1997, Mr. Beckwith joined his brother's company and 
he and his brother at that time were the only people working for Echo Energy. In during 1997 to 2008, Echo Energy began to grow and grew substantially. And Mr. Beckwith's duties also started to grow substantially. Initially, he was um, a salesperson for Echo Energy and his brother had given him the title President of Operations. In March 2007, Mr. Beckwith and his wife through um, a Beckwith, through Beckwith Family Trust, purchased a home at 810 South Juanita in Redondo Beach, California. But after that, their marriage started to slide downhill and they separated and in 2007, they were divorced and Mr. Beckwith got the um, San Juanita property as his part of the marriage settlement. Now, by that time, he had been working approximately nine years for Echo Energy. And as it grew, his brother wanted him to move to Nashville, to Franklin, to work at the business full time because of the needs and demands of the business. In April 2008, Mr. Beckwith bought a property at 1089 Vaughn Crest Drive in Franklin, Tennessee. It was a over 9,000 square foot home on approximately one acre of land, which was rather sizable for a single man. But he bought that home because it was next door to his brother Larry's home. And Larry was married and had two sons and a daughter. Also, David's, Mr. Beckwith's wife and mother, I mean, wife, mother and sister resided in Franklin, Tennessee, and that was also the headquarters of Echo Energy. So in approximately May of 2008, Mr. Beckwith moved to Tennessee, became a domiciliary and resident of Tennessee. While in Tennessee, he joined the Citizens Club in Nashville and also attended Cross Point Church, which he attended on a regular basis. In now then, in 2011, things began to change. First, in late 2011, his brother Larry and his wife sep divorced. Secondly, in late 2011, Mr. Beckwith and his brother began discussing the possibility of selling Echo Energy. Um, they initially consulted with Wells Fargo Bank, which indicated to them that the company, it would be difficult to sell the company. In April of 2012, Echo Energy engaged Piper Joffrey to advise and assist it with respect to selling Echo Energy. Also in March of 2012, due to the fact that his brother had divorced and moved out of the home next to him, Mr. Beckwith decided to put his home on Vaughn Crest Drive up for sale and to begin looking for a condominium in a smaller residence, a condominium in Nashville, in the Gulch area to move to. Um, it was about this time that Mr. Beckwith became involved with a young woman who lived in Los Angeles um, named Lauren Frey. He dated Mr. Frey in, I believe he started seeing her in, February or March of 2012, he had, um, and they became, you know, very, they became close. He started courting her in March or April 2012, Ms., through an acquaintance of Ms. Frey, Mr. Beckwith was um, informed about a property located at 6136 West 5th Street in Los Angeles that could be acquired in a short sale for a below market price. Mr. Beckwith began negotiations and in by mid-April of 2012, he had come to general terms with the owner of the property, a gentleman named Wyatt Earp. And um, in on or about April 20th, a law firm that Mr. Beckwith engaged began working on 
the um, sale documents for the sale and this property was sold and escrow closed July 2012. Mr. Because the property needed renovation and remodeling, Mr. Beckwith hired a contractor, Highcrest, and other contractors to work on the property with the start date of July 30th, 2012, and an end date of five months, which would have been the end of December 2012. At this point in time, Mr. Beckwith viewed the property as an, invest, a law, an investment that if he upgraded and renovated and remodeled, could be sold at a profit. And when he was in September of 2012, Mrs. Ms. Frey had a small apartment. In September of 2012, the property, the West Fifth Street property was renovated enough so that um, there was room, so he moved, so Ms. Frey moved into the place, into the West Fifth Street property. When Mr. Beckwith was visiting her, he would stay with her in California. He would stay with her at the Fifth Street property, but he was there for the purpose of courting her and not for the purpose of residing in California. He was still involved with Echo Energy, with, which was his um, employer, which was the source of his income. And he, at that point in time, had no intention of moving to California or becoming a California resident. During this period of time, Mr. Beckford continued to look for a condominium that was suitable in, Cal in Nashville. He also was having discussions and about form setting up a brew pub restaurant in Nashville, which would take a lot of time and energy on his part. Include and he was involved in that venture with his brother and with um, Benjamin Walker and with Dean Shermay, who was a celebrity chef. Um, they looked at properties for to lease to set up a brew pub in the fall of 2012. At the same time, Mr. Beckwith had put his home up on the market, but he could not get any offers for the price he put it up with. So he offered it he, for sale at his purchase price. And he finally found a buyer and the property was sold and escrow closed on October 31st, 2012. Um, because of all the furniture in there and in the home, because he had a 9,600 square foot home or 90, over 9,000 square foot home in, um, on Vaughn Crest Drive, and he was looking for a smaller condominium. The, he decided to put the furniture and furnishings up for sale. So in a late sept in September, October of 2012, he met with Michael Taylor of Michael Taylor Moving and Estate, Estate and Moving Sales Company um, to take the furniture from the Vaughn Crest home and move it out and ultimately put it up for sale, which they did. And on October 17th, Mr. Beckwith um, vacated the premises. He basically, his residence at that point in time became his mother's home at 437 King Arthur Drive in Franklin, Tennessee. He had his bank statements for his Bank of America accounts sent to that address. He had his credit cards sent to that address. He had his driver's license, his Tennessee driver's license um, with um, change to show that his address, his pay stubs from Echo Energy reflected that address and it was his con intention at that point in time to remain in Tennessee and unless and until the Echo Energy was sold, to remain a resident and live in Tennessee. Um, in honor about November 1, or in late October or, or November of 2012, Echo Energy Holdings entered into an agreement with Copper Sucre, which is a Brazilian alternate fuel company um, for the sale of 
the business to Koper Sucker. That required a lengthy and detailed due diligence um, provisions and the due diligence at which time after the due diligence was completed, the company would close. However, as in all transactions involving the sale of a large corporation, um, there is always the possibility that the sale will fall through. And up until the time that the sale closed, Mr. Beckwith had no intention at that point in time of becoming a resident of California. During this time, he spent time in California and in other places um, in November and December. And on November, December 18th, 2012, Mr. Beckwith came to um, Tennessee for the closing of the sale, which occurred on November 19th. But as anyone knows who's involved in whether it's a real estate transaction or a business transaction, like the saying goes, it isn't over till it's over. The sale closed on November 19th, and it was not until that time that Mr. Beckwith, after the sale closed, that Mr. Beckwith decided that he would move to California. He was in Tennessee for the 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st. He then went to California on the 22nd, and then on the 24th, he and Ms. Frey um, went to Las Vegas for a few days and then they went on vacation. And Mr. Beckwith came back to California on January 3rd and then became a permanent resident of California. And after which he then bought investment property in California in 2013. He leased a, a property in, Cal in Los Angeles and opened up a restaurant in Los Angeles, but his, his intent was to remain a resident of, Calif of Tennessee and not become a re and not move from Tennessee until the sale of Echo Energy was completed and he no longer had you an obligation two minutes to that remaining. company. That's, and you have two so minutes we believe remaining. that after, I know that your honor, thank you. And so after the court hears all the testimony and examines all the exhibits, we believe that the panel will come to the conclusion that Mr. Beckwith remained a resident of Tennessee on November 19th, 2012, and did not become a resident of California until afterwards. Thank you, Your Honor. Sorry for the interruption. I just want to make sure you got everything you wanted to do um, within the 15 minutes. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hofstall, are you ready for your opening? Yes, I am. Please begin. Good afternoon. Uh, as I said earlier, my name is Ron Hofstall. I represent the Franchise Tax Board and, and with me, uh, and we'll be speaking a little bit later, is Desiree de Macedo. Uh, and this is my opening statement. Uh, Mr. Beckwith agrees that he was a California resident through May 16th, 2008, when he relocated to Tennessee to work for Eco Energy. At that time, Mr. Beckworth owned a significant stake in the company. Mr. Beckworth also agrees that soon after he sold his Eco Energy stock, he returned to California. What is at issue is whether Mr. Beckworth was a California the resident on December 19th, 2012, the day he sold the stock, and some two weeks prior to when Mr. Beckworth agrees that he became a California the resident. The vast majority of residency cases we see at the FTB and is likely seen here at the Office of Tax Appeal involve facts very, very dissimilar to ours. Prior to the sale of a capital asset, the taxpayer begins to acquire connections in a new state, while at the same time, he arguably severs his or her connections in the old state. But ultimately, residency, and whether it's severed, acquired, or both at the time of the sale, is determined by evaluating the connections that the taxpayer had with each state, here, Tennessee and California, at the time the asset is sold. Cases, including the recent de decisions in Mazur and Bracamonte, essentially put a taxpayer's connections into three silos, connections acquired, connections severed, and connections maintained. Also, 
not all factors are given the same weight. Mazur, Bracamonte, and like cases give significantly more weight to factors such as physical presence and family abode. While Ms. Macedo will be talking about this in greater detail either later today or tomorrow, it's worthwhile to note now that it is undisputed that Mr. Beckworth both acquired and occupied a new home in California a few months before the sale. That Mr. Beckworth had entered into a committed relationship in California with Ms. Frey and had actually became engaged and were fiancés um, uh, prior to the sale. Um, that Mr. Beckworth had relocated his fiance to this new California home before the sale. And other than trips to Mexico, Arizona, and Las Vegas, where Mr. Beckworth stayed in a hotel, Mr. Beckworth lived exclusively in his new California home. And sharing it with his fiance essentially made it his family abode. It's also worthwhile to note, as reflected in Joint Exhibit 16J, which is at page 2767, that starting in May 2012 and in each subsequent month, Mr. Beckworth spent exceedingly more time in California than Tennessee. And what this exhibit makes abundantly clear is that the connections related to physical presence favored California as early as May 2012. And in fact, from the middle of April 2012 through December 31st, Mr. Beckworth spent a grand total of about 34 business days in Tennessee, the remainder and the remaining primarily in, in California. It's also undisputed that Mr. Beckworth severed his most significant Tennessee connections prior to the Eco Energy sale. He stopped working for Eco Energy in Tennessee. He sold his Tennessee home. He arranged for an estate sale company to sell his personal items located in Tennessee. His vehicle, the one whose lease was not soon to expire, was shipped to California, and Mr. Beck returned his firearm to a Tennessee gun shop. All this happened well before the sale of Eco Energy. By November 1st, 2012, it was clear that Mr. Beckworth had little in Tennessee at the ready for, alleged, for, for an alleged return. And consistent with having nothing at the ready, except for being in Tennessee to close the Tennessee sale, Mr. Beckworth had not, during the relevant time, returned to Tennessee. The only connections that Mr. Beckworth maintained were holdovers for when he was clearly a resident of California, his 2008 California abode, and providing support to his stepdaughter. But what makes this case different than the typical case we see is that in this matter, Mr. Beckworth moved to California, while most controversies involving taxpayers moving from California. But regardless, if a person is arguably moving to California or from California, the law and analysis, including the evaluation of the benefits and protections received by Mr. Beckworth during the relevant time, as well as the weighing of connections that Mr. Beckworth acquired, severed, and maintained during the relevant time is essentially the same. Over the next two days, we'll be hearing from three witnesses, I guess, Two, two witnesses now, not including Mr. Beckworth. The testimony of these witnesses serves only one purpose, to shift the focus from what, from what connections Mr. Beckworth had acquired and severed and maintained to a discussion of what Mr. Beckworth could have done and would have done had an unlikely intervening event occurred. That being said, the focus of this controversy is properly placed with what Mr. Beckwith did. And any attempt by Mr. Beckwith to shift this focus must be met with skepticism. This being said, the issue before us is not whether Mr. Beckworth or Beckwith was a resident of Tennessee under Tennessee law, but whether Mr. Beckworth was a resident of California under California law. Mr. Beckworth with, excuse me, will be deemed a California resident if it is determined that he was inside California for other than a temporary or, trans, uh, temporary or transitory purpose regardless of his state of domicile. And the facts, as Ms. Maceda will discuss later, will reflect that Mr. Beckworth, Beckwith began reconnecting with California as early as April tw uh, tw 2012, such that by November 1st, 2012, if not earlier, Mr. Beckworth had ramped up his California connections and severed his Tennessee connections to the point that it was very clear 
that under California law, he was a California DTTTT resident. The transition described in the Noble case was complete. And Mr. Beckwith remained a California D resident at least through the 2020 tax year, if not beyond. And in fact, he opened restaurants in Lewis D. Feliz in Ojai, California. In fact, the first restaurant was well underway in early 2013. This is well documented through cancel checks. Significantly, deciding whether a taxpayer's presence is for a temporary or transitory purpose involves the analysis of what Mr. Beckworth did, not what Mr. Beckworth could have, would have, and arguably should have done. Mr. Beckworth will also be deemed a California D resident if, as a California domiciliary, he was outside of California for a temporary or transitory purpose. Acquiring a new domicile requires the coexisting of physical presence and intent. Importantly, an intent is, in is, is evaluated through what Mr. Beckworth did, his actions, not by Mr. Beckwith's or, or Beckwith's stated intention, or for that matter, what, what, what witnesses may imply could have happened. And here, as Ms. Macedo will discuss later, Mr. Beckwith's intent, as seen through his conduct, leads to only one result, that he was a resident of California on December 19, 2012. Later, Ms. Macedo will present the law, the facts, and interplay of the facts to the law after we meet the, after we, we meet the witnesses and, and appellates present their case. Thank you. Mr. Hostel. Go ahead and call the first witness. Um, let me confirm, Mr. Horowitz, you're calling Mr. Beckwith first. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Beckwith, I'm going to swear you in before you begin your testimony. Please raise your right hand. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, go ahead and begin. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Beckwith. Yes. Um, what is your current occupation? Um, I'm a real estate investor and I do investments. And could you tell us a little bit about your background, your education, and what your occupation was prior to becoming involved with Echo Energy? Um, I went to, I finished high school, I went to two years of college, then I joined my father in his family carpet business. And uh, my brother and myself, we um, expanded the business to a wholesale business where we manufactured carpeting and imported uh, rugs and carpets from Europe. Um, and then I joined uh, my brother's company in 1997 and became a, a minority shareholder in his company. Where there were two shareholders, myself and my brother. And where was your father's... Um, carpet company located? It was on Pico Boulevard in West Los Angeles. Now, in about 1990, you got married? Correct. And who were you married to? Erica Machado. And did she have any children? Yes, Kylie Machado. Okay, and in, when did the marriage to Ms. Machado end? I believe it was 2007. Late 2006 or 2007, I can't remember. And at that point, prior to your um, separation and divorce, did you and Ms. Machado purchase property in Redondo Beach or South Juanita? Yes. Sorry, gentlemen, let me and, interrupt you. Um, we're having a, real, a hard time hearing you both with the echo. Um, let's take a break for five minutes and see if we can get somebody, whether it's Mr. Beckwith or Mr. Horowitz, to call on the phone. But stay, stay online until we can get this resolved. So can I have everyone just mute? 
and or turn off the video if you want to take a break really quick it's for five minutes. Okay, great. Let's see if we have everybody back with us before we go back on the record. Um, Mr. Horowitz, are you with us? I'm with you, Your Honor. All right, I see both of my judges and Mr. Hostel, Ms. Macedo, and Mr. Byrne. Okay, I think we have everybody. All right, I'm going to restart um, just because I don't think we got much of what was said before, Mr. Horowitz, just to let you know. Um, we'll go back on the record and then we'll start again. So we are now back on the record. Mr. Horowitz, can you please begin your testimony um, with Mr. Beckwith? Thank you. Um, Mr. Horowitz, let's start from the beginning. I'm restarting the timer as well. Mr. Beckwith, could you tell us something about your background, education, and where you worked before you started at Echo Energy? Yes, I, uh, I graduated high school, Beverly Hills High School, and then I um, attended uh, San Diego State for two years. And I worked in the, uh, after I left school, I worked in my family business, a carpet business called Berry Carpet, my dad owned in West Los Angeles, on um, Pico and Sepulveda. Did we lose Mr. Horowitz? No, he's muted. No, I'm muted. It keeps on, uh, finally. It, it, I hit unmute and it muted again as soon as I started talking. Sorry, Your Honor. Um, in approximately 1990, you married Erica Machado? Yes, Erica Machado. And did she have a, any children? Yes, Kylie Machado. And approximately how old was Kylie when you got married? Uh, when I first met her, she was about five months old. Um, and when we married, I believe she was about a year and a half. And in 2000, March of 2006, you and Ms. Machado purchased a home in Redondo Beach at, on South Juanita? Yes. And what happened to your marriage after you purchased the home? Uh, we separated and got a divorce in late 2006, early 2007. I don't know the exact date. And could you tell us something about the um, property settlement? Yes. Of the uh, divorce? She got a house in Manhattan Beach, and I and I got the house at 810 South Cornea in the property settlement. And were you also required to pay alimony, spousal support? Yes. And what were the arrangements for spousal support? I was to pay spousal support for 10 years. Now then, you went to work for Echo Energy in 1997? Yes. Could you tell us something about Echo Energy, its founding, what its business was when you joined it? Yes, it was mandated that um, California um, blended 10% ethanol in their fuel. And um, my brother started the company with an ex-college roommate and he, uh, he was the buffer zone be between the farmer and the major oil company. So he would source the ethanol for them to blend. And then it, it spread to other states. And um, after five years in the business, my brother in 1997 split with his partner and he brought me in as the second person at his company. And that company was Echo Energy? Yes, sir. And did Echo Energy manufacture ethanol or just act as a middleman? 
we act as a middleman. We did the marketing, logistics, transportation, storage, and uh, you know, for the for the uh, ethanol plants, we did offtake agreements with the ethanol plants. Everything they manufactured, we we bought and sold. And so you were at Echo Energy was in effect the exclusive buyer from its. Um, the manufacturers it did business with? Yes. And when you started work at Echo Energy, what were your duties? Um, my brother had 20 accounts and he wasn't doing a lot of business with 10 of them, so he offered me to service 10 of the accounts and we I built up the business considerably on those 10 accounts and our business started growing, we started adding people and so forth. But I was mainly a salesman when I first started at the company. And in time, did your duties change? Yes. Um, we, we started expanding and um, my brother appointed me president of operations and um, I went from there. When you first began at Echo Energy, what was the growth? Um, I believe we we were doing about two hundred and fifty million dollars in business when we first when I first started. And in two thousand and eight, you moved to Tennessee. Yes. And what was your reason for moving to Tennessee? Uh, the business was growing and I was just, uh, my brother asked me to move there because I needed to be present to, to basically run the company, the operations side of the company. What was involved in running the operations side? Um, you know, I, I have still I still maintain key major accounts, but I had salesmen who worked under me and reported to me, um, marketing people, and uh, you know, just met on a daily basis from a high level perspective with my brother and ran the physical side of the, the uh, business. My brother did more of the uh, accounting and uh, you know money side of the business. And when you moved to Tennessee, you purchased a home on Vaughn Crest Drive? Correct. Could you describe the home, what it was like, um, how big of a lot it was? It was on an acre lot. It was 9,200 square foot approximately, way too big for one person. Why did you purchase a home that size as a single person? There was one house between my brother and myself and my nieces and nephews, my niece and nephews. So you moved there to be close to your brother and his family? Yes. Okay. Now, besides your brother, your nieces, your nephews, did you have any other relatives living in Franklin that time? My mother and my sister. And what type of neighborhood was Vaughn, was the Vaughn Kest Drive property in? It was an affluent uh, private gated community. Okay, now besides Echo Energy, were you and your brother, were you involved in any other businesses in Tennessee? Yes, uh, in uh, late, 2011-2012, I was involved with Local Mistress Records, which was a record company. Um, I did I did some work with uh, Fertile Products, which was a products company, and I did Spry Capital with my brother and Chad Martin. But uh, nothing really nothing really arose out of that. We just tried to do investments, but nothing really came came through to fruition. Okay, now then, let's, I wanted first to focus your attention on 2012. Um, in 2012, February 2012, did you, were you in Los Angeles? 
Yes. And why did you go to Los Angeles in February? Well, my brother and I were invited to the Grammy Awards. And Music Cares, was, which is a, a, a charity event as well, the night before the Grammy Awards. I'm sorry, what kind of no. charity event? Pardon me? What was the name of the charity event? Music Cares. Thank you. Thank you. Now, did you any, invite anyone to go with you to Music Hairs? Yes, Lauren Frey. And how did you know Lauren Frey? Uh, we met in Nashville a few months prior um, through a mutual friend named Melissa. And after meeting, after going out to Music, was this the first time you would gone out with Miss Frey to Music Cares? Yeah, we actually went as friends. And after this, did you begin dating Miss Frey? Yes, I did. And it was a long distance relationship? Correct. Okay, did she come out to see to Nashville while you were dating? Yes, I believe a few times. I don't remember exactly. And did you also go on vacations with her? Yes, I did. Now I want to turn to the West Fifth Street property. Yes. Okay. And before that, during this time, you were still working at. Um, Echo Energy? Yes. And how did it come to, how did the Fifth Street property come to your attention, attention as a potential purchase? Um, when I, when I would visit California, I would stay in Miss Bray's apartment and it wasn't the best neighborhood and uh, her friend, who was a realtor said she had a really good deal a short sale on a property located on Fifth Street. And when you bought it, when you, why did you become interested in the West Fifth, Fifth Street property? Um, you know, I thought I would buy it for a place to stay when I came into town, and and Lauren could stay there instead of her apartment, so she would be safe and have a nice place to stay. Did you view it as a place that would be your principal residence? Not yet, no. Okay, and who was the seller of the property? His name was Wyatt Earp. And was, what was, could you describe the condition of the property when you purchased it? Uh, it needed renovations. And you entered into a contract with Mr. Earp to purchase the property? Correct. Who was Kurini and Teitelbaum? Uh, Elliot Teitelbaum was a friend of mine and he's an attorney, a real estate attorney. And he, he was hired to do the agreement, I believe. And now then besides, um, and so during what did you, when did the escrow close on the purchase of the Voice Fifth Street property? I believe in July, I don't have an exact date. And did you hire, you said that the property needed some work when you acquired it? Correct. Correct. How extensive was the work that needed to be done? 
It was pretty extensive. Uh, all three baths were remodeled. The kitchen was remodeled. The hardwood floors were refinished. It was painted. The garage was turned into a pool house. It was pretty expensive. And who was the contractor you hired? Lubeck Abrami with High Crest Construction. And could you turn to exhibit book binder page 2764? I can't. You could tell me what it is. I don't have another computer. It's the only one I have. Okay. It is the high crest. Um, the invoice from high crest dated. July 2nd, 2012. Yes. And it says at the bottom that the work start date 7-30-2012 and time of completion, the contractor should complete the project within five months from the start date. Correct. Was that approximately when the project began? They began the work? Yes. And five months would put it at the end of December. Is that approximately when the project was completed? I believe everything was finished complete was more towards the end of January 2013. The main thing that we were waiting for was a special order window from uh, a place called Nano Windows. So I believe, to the best of my memory, it was uh, mid to late January 2013 when the project was complete. Okay, and were permits pulled for the project? I don't believe so, because uh, he said there was no square footage that was added, it was all cosmetic work, and I don't believe he did full permits. By he, you mean Mr. Abrami? Mr. Abrami and Mr. Winters, who is an architect friend of mine, who helped with the project as well. Now then, when did you and your brother begin discussing the possible sale of Echo Energy? I believe it was late 2011. And could you tell us about those discussions? Yeah, we, we were afraid that uh, mandates were going to, government mandates were going to change and that, you know, that they weren't going to be a, mandated to blend ethanol with gasoline. And we, it was just time, the business was getting very large and uh, we just thought it was a good time to sell. And did you do any investigation at that time about the sellability of the company? Yes, we, we hired Wells Fargo. We were, we, were, we were interviewing them and they came and went through our books and said that the business was not saleable at the time when we first were going to sell the business. And this would have been at the end of 2012? No, this would have been at the end of 2011. I'm, okay, sorry. And approximately at this time, at the end of 2011, is when your brother divorced his wife? Yes, I believe so, yes. Now then, in April of 2012, Echo Energy engaged Piper Joffrey? Correct. And what was the reason for engaging Piper Joffrey? To sell the company. And what were you involved in the attempts to sell the company? From a high level, I was I was more of an operations guy, as I said. But my brother and I talked on a regular basis, and my brother and I replaced ourselves with another CEO and CFO, so we wouldn't have to work for the company if it did it did in fact sell. So and what do you mean, level. so you wouldn't have to? 
What do you mean that you wouldn't have to work for the company if it's sold? If it's sold, we wouldn't have to be present and work for the new company. So we did replace ourselves, but we were we were definitely you know talked on a regular basis from a high level perspective. Still ran the company. So by the spring of 2012, you no longer were a officer of Echo Energy. I was no longer president of operations now. And what was your position with the company? I just basically sat on the board with my brother and had high level meetings. And it would, you know, we would talk about the sale of the company and what was going on, you know, on a daily basis with the company. In March of 2012, you put the Vaughn Crest property up for sale? Yes. And why did you do that? Several reasons. My brother moved from his house next door, and it was just too big and depressing for one person. It was just, I just didn't, uh, just didn't want to be there anymore. And at that point, when did you, did you start looking for another place? Yes, I, um, my realtor, John Law, uh, took me to look at high-rise condominiums in the Gulch area of downtown Nashville. Um, and I started looking for a high-rise condominium to live in. What's the Gulch? It's like a hip part of Nashville. It's, you know, in, near downtown where it's, you know, yeah, it's not a suburban. Okay, and why were you looking for a place in Nashville? Why was I looking for a place in Nashville? Because I was Correct. going to remain in Nashville. I was going to remain in Nashville until the business sold as my primary residence, and I wanted to scale down from that big house. And were you at this point in time in the spring? of 2012 were you also investigating other possible business ventures in nashville yes i was looking to open up a german beer house with uh with celebrity chef dean charmay and benjamin walker and my brother we were looking to open up a brew house and what was german your involvement in that um, I was going to launch it with Dean. I was going to be the business side of launching it. And what were Ben Walker and your brother going to do? They were going to be more passive partners and invest financially. And did you take any gonna... steps? Oh, go ahead, and continue. Go ahead, continue. Oh, that's... I was going to be the the partner that was more actively involved with the concept and setting up the, uh, you know, the brew house and the dealing with contractors, construction, and so forth. And what steps were taken towards um, getting the brew house on board? We looked at some cases with John Lott again, and then Benji knew this guy, Jim Caden, who owned the most successful restaurant chain. M Street, and they had a they had a building they were willing to rent us right next to the Virago, which was their biggest restaurant. And we went and saw that and came very close to renting it, but just could not come to terms. Okay, do you know approximately when this was? I believe it was a colder month. I believe it was somewhere near October, I believe. I don't remember exactly, but I believe it okay, was. Okay, could you time. do you have do you have access to the exhibit binder? I do not. I only have one computer and I'm on it with you guys. Okay. The page twenty seven sixty seven, which is the um calendar showing where you were in 2012 shows that you were in 
Tennessee from October 9th through the 18th. Would that be the time from when you looked at that property that Mr. Caden had? I really don't recall. I don't recall when it was exactly. Okay. What happened with the property that you looked at that Mr. Caden had for lease? As I said, we could not come to terms. He was too high on the price and wanted too much. And did you look we at any looked, other properties? Yeah, we looked at a couple other places to buy and, and tour different places, but nothing came to fruition. I continue to talk to Dean throughout the year and even into early, uh, you know, early 2013, you know, about doing something, but nothing ever came to fruition on that. Okay, and now then, in October 2012, you sold the Vaughn Crest Drive property? Correct. And what was the market like for um, the property at, during 2012? From what I remember, it was dipping, it was starting to really decline, and there wasn't much demand. And did you what did, did you sell it for? I believe when I bought profit? it for one. 1.7 million, I did not make a profit. And when did you move out, out of the Vaughn Crest property? I believe it was mid-October uh, mid 2012, as uh, Michael, Michael uh, Taylor from Taylor Estate Sales had to get all the furniture out of there. And why did he have to get all the furniture out of there? Because they were going to close that school. And at this point in time, were you still looking for a condominium in Nashville? I believe so. At, at that time, all through all through 2012, but um, in the level, more towards the mid to the second and third quarter. I don't believe I did in the fourth quarter. Would you have looked to for a condominium in October when you were in Nashville for approximately 10 days? Possibly, yes. I don't know for sure. I can't say for sure. Um, now then, in the late October, you went to Los Angeles, is that correct, of 2012? Yes. And why did you go back to Los, why did you go to Los Angeles? My timing could be off, but I believe I was getting engaged to Lauren at the time. Had you asked her to marry you at that time? I went ring shopping with her and we bought a ring and I believe I did, I, to the best of my memory, I believe I did and then we went to Las Vegas and I re-proposed in front of her parents. That's the best of my memory, I believe that happened. Okay, now then, what was going on with the sale of Echo, efforts to sell Echo Energy at that point in time? I believe we engaged in a deal with Copasuka in, um, let's see, it was, uh, I believe it was November of, November of 2012. The agreement, which is an exhibit is dated effective as of November 1, 2012. Would that have been approximately the date that you signed the agreement? Yes. And at the date it was signed, was it a done deal? No, no it wasn't. And why is that? 
Well, a lot of these deals don't go through, and especially this particular deal because it was a um, foreign, they, it was a company from a foreign country, and, uh, you know, it was a very complex deal, and, you know, they had, they had a um, data room set up and went through our books for weeks, and, you know, they had a lot of different hurdles to cross before it was a done deal. Now, at that point in time, had you made a decision of whether to move to California? I did not. I mean, at the time. time Pardon me? Go ahead. I did not at that time. I was waiting to see what happened with the company and the sale. Now then, besides, when you moved out of vacated the premises at Vaughn Crest in mid-October 2012, did you have your mail forwarded? Yes, I did. And where did you have it forwarded to? To my mom's house, the 237 King Arthur Circle. And did you have the um, your bank statements, the address for those to be sent changed? Correct. And where did you have those sent to? 237 King Arthur Circle as well. And did you have the address for your credit card statements changed? Yes, same address my mom's and where did, you, did you have your, at that point in time, what state in 2012, what state did you have your driver's license? Oh, that would be Tennessee. And did you change the address on your what, driver's license to 437? I don't King remember. Arthur. It. It's 237 King Arthur Circle, but I don't remember 230. that, to be honest. I don't recall. If the Tennessee um, DMV records show that your address was 237 King Arthur, would that indicate that you changed the address when you moved? Yes. And did you spend time at your mother's house after you vacated the premises? I spent a little time at my mother's house and my brother's house when I was in Nashville, anytime I was in Nashville. Now, during uh, November and December 2012, um, you spent time outside of California? Yes. And where did you go when you were outside of California? I believe Mexico, Arizona, um, Las Vegas, um, Nashville. Um, I think I went to Mexico two times, I'm not. I don't quite remember. Okay, now let's go back a little bit toward to your relationship with Ms. Frey. Um, yes. You helped her out financially in 2012? Yes. And in September 2012, she moved into the um, West Fifth Street property? Yes. And what was the condition of the property at that time? It was getting better, you know, it got better and better as the construction got off, came along. And were there all of the rooms completed at that point in time? I don't believe so. I don't remember exactly what stage of the process it was in September, but just given the fact that, uh, you know, there was a lot of a lot of construction being done, I would think that it wasn't completed, you know, still, it was still somewhat of a construction zone. Some rooms came before others. Now then, you had two cars in 2012? Yes. And what were they? I had a Prius and a Jaguar. 
And where were they registered in 2012? In, in Tennessee. And you shipped the Prius to California in mid-20, yeah. August of 2012? Why did you do that? So I had a car when I was in town, and, and Lauren used it as well. And the Jaguar remained in Tennessee? Correct. Why did that remain in Tennessee? It was the nicer car, and that's where my primary residence was. Okay. Now, were you involved at all in the due di diligence process um, for the sale of Echo Energy? Very little. I wasn't a financial Who guy. Was the... I was... Oh, go ahead. Okay, no, you finish. I wasn't much involved with the actual sale of the company. It wasn't my strength, and I wasn't a financial guy, and I've never been involved in an M&A uh, deal before prior. Okay. Who were the people who were um, doing the due diligence for the sale on the Echo Energy side? Oh, on the Echo Energy side, it was, well, there was Chad Martin, our CEO, Wayne Tom, our CFO, my brother Larry, um, and then the heads of every department, like Chad Tom um, was the, um, the head of storage and logistics. Um, we had an accounting head, Dave Johnson, um, risk management person, Mike Loke, too. So the heads of all departments, I believe, were interviewed as well in the process. And I would talk to my brother on almost a daily basis, and he kept me abreast of what was going on. Okay, and what, what else was your involvement in the company at this time while the due diligence was being done? Well, we, we ran the company from a macro, 30,000 foot macro view, like we were on a board of directors and discussed what was going on with the company on almost a daily basis. Now, at the time that the due diligence was going on, had you moved to California? No. And prior to the closing of the sale, had you moved to California? No. And why when did you decide to move to California? After the closing of the business, it's just like you said in the opening argument, it's like a real estate deal. A lot of them don't go through. And until it was a done deal, it was it was not a done deal until it was a done deal. So then I um, then I did. Go ahead, finish. As I said, until it was a done deal, it wasn't a done deal. And then I decided once it you, closed. And you, you, the deal closed on the 19th of December? Correct. Correct. Um, you came to Nashville before that, the day or before that? Yes. At that time, and what was the reason for your coming to Nashville? For the closing of the business. So at, at that time, did you know that the business was going to close for sure? Not until it closed for sure. And after, and that was on December 19th? Correct. And prior to that time, did you discuss with any of your friends the f you're moving to California before December 19th? I don't believe so. I don't remember if I discussed, if I told people I was moving there or not. 
it well at that point in time? Had you, prior to the 19th, had you decided to move to California? I did not decide to move to California until the business closed. Now, based on the calendar, which is exhibit binder page 2767, it shows that you were in Nashville 18, uh, December 18th through the 21st, in California the 22nd, 23rd, and part of the 24th. What happened after, um, what did you do when you went to California after the close? The best of my memory, I believe I picked Lauren up on the 22nd and we went to Las Vegas for Christmas and then we went on to Mexico and returned in California January 3rd. That's the best of my memory. And when did you take up residence in California? Well, I, I, January, January 3rd is when I stayed permanently, but I mean, a very minimum, it would have been the 22nd of December and the max would have been January 3rd. And after you, came back, came to California on January 3rd, do you take any steps to establish residency? Yes, I uh, got a driver's license. I started uh, investing in California. I got, I got three apartment buildings in 2013. I opened a restaurant in 2013. I started planting roots with business if that's what you're asking. Yes, now then in 2012, did you belong to any clubs or social organizations in Nashville? I belong to a Citizen Night Club and I belong to Cross Point Church. And I also and went to, I went to a, another church called the Brentwood Baptist every, on Tuesday nights a lot as well. And when you were in LA in 2012, did you belong to or join any churches? I did not, not until 2013, late 2013. And did you join any social clubs in LA in 2012? I did not. Um, now then, the uh, I'm having trouble with my mouse. Um, when did you? What happened with your relationship with Miss Fry? Miss Frey. Um, yeah, Miss Frey. We ended up ended up breaking up. I think it was March or April of 2013. And had the business not closed? Did you have any discussions with your brother Larry? about what would happen if the sale of Echo Energy did not close. Yeah, he told me he would, he told me he would have signed an affidavit, but it was too late when I talked to him and he said that he would have made sure I had to remain in Nashville if the company did not sell. And, okay, so if the company, your moving to California was contingent on the sale of the company closing then? Correct. Okay, I have nothing further. Or wait, could I have one second, Your Honor?
Okay, I have nothing further. Um, since we had a break, let's keep moving forward if that is working for everybody. Um, Mr. Hostel, would you like to start cross examination? I would, thank you. Okay. Mr. Beckwith, first I want to apologize by calling you several times, Mr. Beckworth, uh, during my opening presentation, for some reason, I have worth and width in my head, so I, I want to apologize for that. It's not a, a slide, and not meant to be a slide. Um, I no want to, um, I, I appreciate that. I, I just want to talk about a couple things first that, and that came up during, in, in, in your discussion with Mr. Horowitz, and then I have some specific in the questions for you. I know during the, yeah. the in the opening presentation, and and you had testified as well that, and you, and you described uh, Dean Cheremey as a celebrity chef. Um, I understand he's a celebrity chef now, but we're talking about in 2012. Uh, what what was your understanding of Mr. Cheremey's background, um, and and qualifications in 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 2012? He so. He was somewhat famous because he was married to Leanne Rhimes. I don't know if you know who that is, but she's a she's a well known country singer. And from what I understand, he was he was known as a celebrity chef in 2012. That's my understanding. At least he told me was. Yeah, you know, because when you I you know, and Mr. Cheremey was going to join the join us, and apparently he he's no longer a witness. But but when you look up his page on LinkedIn. You know, he had only graduated from culinary school in 2010 uh, after a six-month program, and he was essentially a, uh, a line chef at first in Nobu and then a line chef um, at, um, at um, uh, George... Um, uh, John George. Uh, George, John George. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I have a culinary background, and, and I know you do as well. I mean, a line chef... Is not the executive chef. It's not the sous chef. It's 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 somewhere down the line. So I'm just trying to get to. I I, I know that he's a celebrity chef now, but that came with time. And I know he was had celebrity because he was he was married to, to Leanne Rhymes. But what qualified him, in your opinion, in 2011, 2012, to 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 to, to operate at this restaurant or help you with this restaurant? Yeah, he was very well known in the Nashville area, just so you know. He was very well known, very popular. Um, and, you know, with with restaurants like Jean Georges and Nobu, the top leading restaurants, he, I felt he was very qualified to do a, a German, a, you know, it was a German beer house. I mean, there was, if you saw his menu, I don't know, did we, did we, I don't know if you saw his menu that he came up with. With for it, but it was it was stuff like sausages and schnitzels. It wasn't anything that was it wasn't anything like fun, you know. Very, you know, it was it was a it was a brew house. I just thought it was more than qualified, and it was right. very so, popular. So it was your understanding at the time that he was going to give up his fine dining experience at both Nobu and and. Um, um, uh, Jean George to go to Nashville to make schnitzel and fry sausage. He actually he lived in he lived in Nashville along with me and so forth. But you know when I was talking to him, yeah, I mean no, so own your own concept and own your own restaurant, be part owner and so forth. Yes, and the only reason we didn't have him testify. Is because the fact was we only had time for two two witnesses. Fair enough. Now, and now you also talked about um, you know spending time in your mother's house and, and and your brother's house in the in the fourth quarter of 2012. Now, if you can go back to the exhibit, the the physical pre the presence at page um, um, 2767. Um, during those four days you were in, in, in Nashville, you obviously spent three nights there. I mean, did, 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 did you spend those nights at your brother's house or your mom's house? I don't recall. I really don't. I believe it was my brother's house, but I don't recall. It's 10 years ago, I just don't recall. 
Okay. And then um, you also talked about, and and I read the the declaration from from uh, from um, um, your broker. What's his name? Um, Ben Walker, and he had said that you and him had looked at um, a property that that Mr. Lott had set up there, there for you in a in a building called the Terrazzo or Terrazzo. Are you familiar with that? Terrazzo, yes. Yeah, and do you recall the the unit number you and you, and you looked at? Oh, not even close. How yeah. about the, how about the floor? I don't remember, but I think it was somewhere on the sixth floor or so, I believe. It wasn't really high, it wasn't on the very bottom, but I believe it was somewhere in the sixth floor range. Great, and, and, and it's my understanding that, and, and that there in, in, in units have one or two store, stories. Was the one in you looked at, was it a one story or a two story? It was one, the one I was looking at was one story with tall ceilings. Okay. And it was my understanding um, also that that unit was for sale for a million dollars, right? I don't know. I don't know how you would know that. I have no idea. I don't remember. Okay. Fair enough. And and you had talked about, um, and I, I didn't get the name of it, but you were talking about an investment and you were doing with both um, Chad Martin and your brother. What kind of investment yeah. were you looking at doing? It was called fraud capital management, and as I told Robert, it never went anywhere. We were just looking at side investments in the, the renewable fuels business. I got you. Your your um, voice is starting to. Am I the only one that's hearing the echo again, or? Are you doing okay, Miss Alonzo? Are you doing okay? What's up? It's getting I hear echoey again on my end. Okay. Um, yeah, a few. Uh, it's getting a little echoey at some parts, and in other parts, it's fine. So I just want to make sure our stenographer was able to transcribe everything. Um, let's. Are we all muted? Everybody looks muted to me. Sorry, Mr. Beckwith, can you try and just enunciate as much as you can and see if that helps a little bit? Yes, I will. I apologize. No, you're doing great. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Mr. Hofstall. Sure. Um, and um, and you were talking about the fact that um, um, you and your brother had discussed selling. Is it Eco Energy or Echo Energy? Eco. Eco, eco, thanks. So, um, uh, and, and you had said, and that you and your brother were discussing um, selling um, eco energy at the end of 2011. True. Correct. Right, and and also at the end of 2011, that was going to be the expiration of the uh, of ethanol t the tariffs, right? I don't believe so. I mean, it was a possibility. It never happened. That I that I'm aware of. Okay. Fair enough. Now, um, in your mom's place on uh, 237 King Arthur Circle, how far away was that from your former residence? Approximately three miles, I'm guessing. Okay. And it was right down the street from the office, less than a mile. Now you said that um, sometime around um, April that um, you and your brother had basically stepped down from your positions and other people were appointed, true? It was sometime in the beginning of uh, 2012, from the best of my memory. Okay, and and who who stepped into your position? Who who became in the president of the uh, of the company? You know, we appointed a CEO that was Chad Martin, and then we appointed a CFO that was Gwen Chong. Gotcha. And both uh, Chad and and Mr. Tong. 
they uh, basically assumed your brothers and yourselves positions, true? That would be true, yes. And uh, yes. All right. Now I'm going to go into my questions and that I have here. I just wanted to get a little bit of clarification. Um, so um, when Mr. Horowitz talked earlier, he had talked about that that and that eco energy was, I guess, almost founded in 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 Tennessee. But it was my understanding that it was actually a a California in the company at first. Is that true? Correct. When my brother lived in California. Great. And 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 when did Eco Energy move from California to to Tennessee? Oh boy. I'm gonna. This is a gap. Um, my brother moved the company, I believe, in 1994. Is my guess? Okay, we'll come now. Maybe the record of it. I... Okay, and um, and then I think you've already said this. They said this, but um, but prior to December 19, 2012, when you sold the property. Eco Energy was primarily owned by you and your brother, true? Correct. Right. And what percentage approximately did, did you have and your brother have in um, at the time of sale? I believe it was somewhere around 18% or 17% and my brother had the rest. Had the rest. And then um, when did you start your in your ownership position was it from the onset of the company or or, or, or was that given to you and later on in the process um, my brother gave me an opportunity to, to buy in shares um, after a few years of working there from the best of my memory i don't know the exact time great so you bought your ownership shares from your brother correct I don't remember the amount, but it was a good price. It was a, he gave me a good deal. Okay, good, good for him. <laughs> and then, um, um, as you said earlier, about May 16th, 20, 2008, um, you joined your brother at Eco Energy in Tennessee, true? That's when I moved to Nashville, correct. Yeah, and, and, and the record also re reflects in that, in that you had bought your home on Von Crest about a month before you actually coming to to Tennessee. Is that is that accurate? That's that's possible. I don't remember exactly, but that is possible. All right. Um, and and do you have access to the exhibits? I do not. Can you tell me what they are? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to talk you through it and then and then we'll see how, how far we can go. OK. Uh, and I'll I'll Thank have you. an exhibit in the, in the number for other people to look, and I'll try to narrate it for you if it's okay. I'm looking at exhibit Thank in number you. 956, and what 956 is basically your Bank of America statement, and it basically shows that basically every other every other week or biweekly, and you had um, uh, income direct deposited into your account from Eco Energy. Is that is that your understanding? That sounds correct. Okay. So you never received a hard check and had a deposit in the bank. The money was automatically transferred in, true? I believe it was direct deposit. I, I don't remember for sure. I, for some reason, I remember deposit stubs, but I could be wrong. But I believe it was direct deposit. Okay. And I'm just going to, you know, I've looked at all the records. And, and, and for the record, if you look at 959, 965, this is exhibit in number 968, 972, 979, 985, 992, 998, 1004, 1010, 1015. They all reflect that you basically they got paid every other week. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so my question is, if you stop working for Eco Energy as president in early 2012, what were you getting paid for? I was still uh, running the company from a 30,000 foot macro view with my brother. Because, and I did talk to employees all the time as well. And I was, you know, I was uh, doing it from a board member perspective. 
and we were we were still very much involved in the company. I just wasn't on a day to day like you know operations person. Right, and 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 and, and you know the, with the echo, it's a little difficult. But you talk about it's a, a three hundred and sixty mi the micro view. Is that is that what you're describing? 30,000 macro view, you know, which was, you know, a bigger, the bigger picture stuff, not okay. the, not the that we're going on everything, but we had, we strategized all the time and planned all the time, my brother and myself. Right. So, 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 so when you were planning and strategizing and you were doing that in California on this, on this 3000 micro view, true. I was doing it from wherever I was. That's correct. Um, and it also looks like, you know, and, and this is where we might be having an issue with the, with the exhibits. I, you know, I, I want you to look at, at, um, at, uh, exhibit 1006 and exhibit what well, the 1006 is basically transactions you made, um, uh, as far as paying your bills. And it looks like, uh, for, from that bill on November 1st. Um, and, uh, and November 6th and November 14th, you basically sat down um, at a computer. You accessed all of your uh, credit card accounts and, 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 and loan accounts and things like that. And then you just paid for um, uh, those bills over the, over the Internet. Um, is that your understanding of how you paid the bills through, through, throughout? Um, uh, Oh, in 2012? I usually use Bank of America online to pay my bills from wherever I was. That's correct. Okay. So um, it shows that the bulk of your bills for like the month of November was paid on November 1st, November 6th, and November 14th. Um, and if you look at exhibit 26, Oh, 2767, you were in California on those days. Um, so the question I have for you, and, and this is where we might be having a little bit of trouble with the exhibits and what we should be doing from, from this point forward. I mean, although you were getting your credit card statements and your mortgage statements and stuff like that sent to your mother's house, the reality is you were just picking up in your computer, going to Bank of America pay and paying those bills wherever you, and you were, whether it was California or elsewhere, true? Yeah, as I, it's an app that you can pay from wherever you are, correct? Right, right. That's true. Yeah, so, you know, like, and like in the old days, you know, I'm, I'm about in your age, you know, when we were just got out of college and you would get a bill and you would have to like clip the bottom of it and 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 you would have to mail a check in, um, and in those days it was very important to have the mail and delivered to you. But in today's world, and it looks like you took advantage of it, is you really didn't need bills sent to a particular place because you were doing all that online. True. That would be correct. And then, um, are you able to look at the? Or do you have a, a copy of exhibit um, 26 or 2767? I don't have, I don't have any uh, copies of anything. I wasn't told I had to do this that one computer. I'm going to see if, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I could do a share screen with you because, because we have it up. I mean, maybe we'll be successful and maybe we won't. Mr. Beckwith, you should have an email from Nia Vaughn with the exhibits. Um, she just emailed them to you recently, just this morning. Um, if you want to check your email, oh. if you're able to check your email. Otherwise, um, we can attempt to uh, share. I hope that I'm on with you guys and on my computer where I'm looking at you guys. I don't know how I would check my emails. I don't have another computer. I could try a laptop that hasn't been working. I could try it. Can you do it? Um, and we're going to see if we can pop in this up and then you can look at us and look at this thing at the same time. This will be the only time I'll do I'll do this to you, I think. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Can you do it, Desiree? Well, 
while we're working on that, I'll just move down a little bit further for the, for the sake of time. Um, we had talked Thanks. earlier, in fact, that there was a discussion. Here, here we go. And do you see that? I see. Yes, I do. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Great. And do you see? And do you see, like, starting in in mid-April, April sixteenth or so, that you, there's a lot of of red from from April on down to December. Yes, I do. Okay. Now, um, uh, uh, you would agree, since the red represents time in California and the blue that represents time in Tennessee, that starting on April sixteenth or so that you're dramatically spending more time in California than, and, and then you are in Tennessee for each one of those months, true? I see that, yes. We had talked earlier about, um, you know, before we had started, we we're talking about whether or not we're going to allow the, the documents in to be admitted. And one of them was a document from your uh, um, attorney who, who you had testified to had helped you with the sale of the West 5th Street property. And that was document in number 902. So isn't it true at the yeah. same time, you know, in, 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 during this, this time frame, you were also receiving mail at the uh, West 5th address? Well, I believe he just sent, that's where, he, that was the property he was working on. I don't remember, but I believe that's where he would send the bill as it was the property he was working on. I don't okay, believe he had any address affiliated okay, with Nashville. I got you. Because if, if, if you look at the prior bill, it's, it's bill in the, in number 900. It shows a, a Tennessee address. So the attorney from one month to the other switched addresses from a Tennessee address to a California address. So that was just, um, you know, a change on their part. So would you agree with me now, knowing that um, uh, this per the, and this attorney had 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 at first sent mail to the Tennessee address that you were receiving mail at West Fifth? Yes, I, I would believe that. But maybe, maybe I was in maybe I was in California when he sent the second bill. I I don't know. I don't remember okay. to be honest with you. I got gotcha. you. And then um, I, I, I'm I'm going to reference a number. I'll try to talk you through it. Um, uh, exhibit number 140. One the 140 is is your W2 for the for the 2012 tax year. Um, uh, and that's come, and that's a bit, and, and, and that's the W-2 from Eco Energy, um, and that actually shows your Vaughn Crest address. So not only were you getting ma a mail at your mom's address and the West Fifth address, you were also were getting mail at your prior address. True. That's possible. I, maybe they just didn't change the address, but yes, that is possible. Now, I want you to look at, I mean, I would have you look at, I'll talk you through it and we'll see how far we can get. Uh, document in, in, in number 189. Can I go back one second, Rob? Sure. Is that all right? Sure. I believe the documents were sent from an outside source, a bookkeeping source, uh -huh. and they probably didn't get my address, but I think on my pay stubs and so forth went to my mom's house okay. for, from, from Eco Energy, but I could be wrong. That's, okay. That's the only explanation. Thank you. Fair enough. Now, now a document in number one eighty nine is is a tax form. It's it's form five forty N R C A, right? Now you just described to us and that you were performing services for Eco Energy in California via this three thousand micro view. And if you look at the and if you look at the in this form, it shows absolutely no California wages earned for the 2012 tax year. Um, was that a mistake? I don't believe so. I don't. I I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. But. Well, I mean, if if you worked in California, if, if you're performing work for California for Eco Energy while you were in California via this 3000 micro view and then and then you would have earnings sourced to california true 
So if I'm if I'm visiting California and call my brother to discuss business, then I'm I'm liable for taxes. I, I, I'm I'm not sure how that works. To be honest. With you. Yeah, I mean, is that your understanding of the tax law? I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, if I'm visiting California and I call my brother to discuss our business, I didn't know I had to pay taxes in California for income I worked with from my national company. Right. But, I, 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 you know, I, I know you're visiting, and I don't mean to get argumentative as far as the, in the visiting, but you also admitted since, May, since April 16th through December 31st, that you spent significantly more time in California and then, and then you did in, te in Tennessee, true? Well, the ca calendar shows that. The red, yeah. red on the calendar shows that. So, yeah, um, so, yeah. And, and, and you talked that. about that, I mean, I don't want to put word, the words in your mouth and you can clarify it for me. I thought you testified and that, that you were essentially in contact with your brother every day regarding work at Eco Energy. Is that, is, is that true? Well, most days, correct. But when I when I seek tax advice, my accountant said that as long as I stay out of California over fifty percent of the time, that's where then I would be okay and I'd still become a visitor. That's that's the tax advice I received. Okay, fair, fair enough. But that's you know, good or bad. <laughs> now, now this is where it's going to get the tricky because I want to talk about a couple of uh, of um, of checks, and I I appreciate the panel's um, uh, patience and with me as we go through th th through all these things. We definitely want to get through you today if we can. Um, uh, uh, the first thing I want to look at is. Um, well, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. You also had an account with um, a bank in Nashville, right? And that was called the, the Fifth, Third, Fifth Third Bank? Yes, I saw that document, and I do not remember what that account was for, but I think it was automatically taken out of my mortgage. And I don't know why I was sent to the Fifth Street address, so I'll tell you right now, I, I have no idea. I tried to figure that out. I yeah, I mean, it, it, it looks like, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, and maybe this will jar your me in your memory. It looks like you basically in the beginning of the year would dump all of your um, mortgage payments for the year in this account, and then your mortgage would, would be debited out uh, each, each month. Does that sound like a plausible explanation? Yeah, it looks like it to me as well, yes. Yeah. All right. And 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 um, um, go, the going through all the bank the records, and you would agree with me, and, and that your Bank of America account was pretty much your primary account, true? Correct. Okay, great. Now the check, the, the first one I want to talk about, and I think you meant you mentioned in this guy's name. I just want cl the clarification: um, is uh, is a check to a gentleman named Brian Winters? Can you tell me so something about Brian Winters? Um, Brian was an architect friend of mine, and he he did help with design and architecture in the Fifth Street address, and also my restroom. He did the restaurant stamp properties. Great. And the, in the check I'm looking at, which is the first one in the in the sequence, is check in number ten fifty seven. It says you gave him a a loan for three thousand dollars. I mean, do you recall to give him a loan? Oh, that was that was just as a friend. He was a friend of mine also, and he couldn't pay his mortgage or rent or something like that. And I did give him a loan. Okay, great. And uh, and one of the was, and one of the things I want to point but, out is 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 if you look at that check, it shows that you're a member of Bank of America since like 1981. True. That's true. Okay. And um and you and you and you you basically signed on to that and and, and that account when you're a resident of California. True. Uh, originally, I signed, I signed up in California, correct? 1981 right. is when I graduated. Right, and, 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 the, and the branch identified with the check is Redondo Beach. Does that sound about right? Uh, originally opened up, that's possible. That's where I originally got married and lived with the first husband in my first marriage of 16 or 17 years. 
I got you. And 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 you had said that you had put your home in in Nashville up for sale starting like in March to 2012. Is that is that correct? I don't remember the exact date to be perfectly honest, but that sounds correct. Now, if 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 you were able to get into the exhibits, exhibit number one, set the seventy would show your in your closing statement for um, for the home, and the uh, and the settlement agent is is Windmill Title LLC. Does that sound do you familiar? Were they the uh, the uh, the escrow of the company on on on, on that project? I don't remember that at all. The only the only person I remember was my realtor, John Mott. I don't remember the title or ask the company at all. Okay. And then this is where it's gonna get a little tricky, and I keep apologizing though for saying this. And there's two checks I want to talk to, to, to you about. And one is check number 1060, and that's to a company called Homeland Title LLC. Um, and that was for two hundred and thirty-eight thousand dollars or or so. Um, and that was a check written, um, um, excuse me, it was a, it was a, a check paid to the order of Bank of America and on the, for the purpose, it said Homeland Title LLC. And it's $238,913.76. Uh, and that was written on January 18th, 2012. Uh, and it's my understanding that uh, Homeland Title is a title company and they're in Franklin, Tennessee. Does that have anything to do with you starting the process of, of winding down and, and starting that sale project of that of, of, of your home in Nashville? I don't believe so. I have no idea what that check would have been for. I really do not. I have 238,000 to a title company. No, it's, it's, it's to Bank of America. And then in the in the uh, in the title and where you describe and what it's for, it says Homeland Title LLC, and that's a, a Franklin, Tennessee-based title co the, the company. And and sir, what was the date on that check? January eighteenth, twenty twelve. Wow, I have no idea what that would have been for. I didn't buy. I don't remember buying any other property in Tennessee. In and then there's well. another check. It was another the check uh, 1067, and that's to Windmill Title. And Windmill Title is is the title company that we just talked about, and that closed your closed your home, and that's for forty five thousand. Would that have so something to do with you closing in your home on Vaughncrest? Oh, maybe maybe I paid down my loan. Is that possible? It could be. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's I don't know. the only thing I could. Because I have the money to do so and pay down my loan, that's the only thing I could think of, honestly. Okay. That's uh, that's the only possibility. Fair enough. And then at check number, and if you need more details on these checks as I describe them, let me know. Yeah. I, I know it's kind of awkward for for you. I'm trying to question you on checks that you can't can't see, but. Uh, I'm I'm trying my best. This was ten years ago. I'm trying my best to yeah. remember from what I don't right. know. So I'm... and at 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 document in number ten seventy one, there's a check to uh, Lauren Frey for one thousand five hundred and sixty two dollars, and in the subject category it says eleven months health care. Did you call the writing a check for her health care? Did I what? Do you, and do you recall writing a check to pay for Ms. Frey's health care? A very good possibility. I don't think she had health insurance, and I think I paid for a year out front for her health. Right. I believe I did. All right. And then starting in, on May 3rd, 2012, um, it looks like you s started to assume a full payment of the rent on the Grace Avenue apartment. Does that sound about right? Correct. Yes. So, sir. yeah. So for May, June, and July, um, and you paid seventeen hundred dollars, which represents like one hundred percent of the rent for the, for that property. True. I would agree that I did that. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you go to 
check number 1097, um, or excuse, excuse me, document number 1097, there's a check to um, um, a gentleman named Harold Koffler, and I believe he was the landlord of that Grace Avenue property, true? Yes, he was the owner. He was the owner, yes. He was the owner. And, and the August 1st check has an amount for just two weeks, $850. And do you recall right, writing a check for the month of August for just half a month? I think, and I could be wrong, because um, I think we need a little bit more time before she moved into the uh, 5th Street property and we extended it a couple weeks instead of a full month. I got you. I believe that. Right, so sometime, and you would agree with me, and that sometime in June or July, you gave Mr. Koffler notice that um, um, the apartment on Gray Street would be vacated, true? Well, it wasn't my lease. I mean, I had nothing to do with it. I was just paying the bill for Lauren, so I, don't, I, I would assume that to be true, yes. And, I would assume, and but she... Right, and, and, and the reason why you gave notice of the Grace Avenue apartment in June or July is because you believed at the time that by August, the West 5th Street property would be ready to move into, true? Objection, Your Honor. Mr. Beckwith said he was not the lessee, so he wouldn't have been the one giving the notice. Ask the question, Mr. Hofstall. Just clarify a little bit, please. Sure. Was it your understanding in June or July of 2012 that the Grace Street or Grace Avenue apartment would be vacated by August 1st, 2012? I don't remember. I don't remember. I, I really don't remember. Okay. Now, it's your check and it's your signature on the check and the check is for $850 on August 1st. And you had just testified that the reason why there's a check for $850 is because you needed additional time to stay in the apartment. Yeah. Through? Yeah. And the reason why you needed additional time is because West 5th wasn't ready by that date and you had planned it to be ready by that date, true? Uh, I would use the word livable. I wouldn't use ready, but that's, that sounds reasonable. Okay. And then it's also my understanding, if you look at check and number, uh, or a document in, in, in number 1103 that you actually wrote another check to Mr. Coughlin for $850 because the apartment wasn't, or West 5th Street, it wasn't in the ready to for occupancy by August 15th and you needed an, an, an additional two weeks, true? On top that of that? That makes sense. Okay. That would make now, sense. <clears throat> you had looked at in a document a little bit earlier that um, talked about, um, 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 it was document number 160, I believe. And 160 is the, is the bill or, the, or the, um, the invoice for the work that Highcrest was going to uh, perform on the West 5th address. And the uh -huh. invoice amount is $47,800. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Okay. Now, if you go back to document number 1099, that's a check to Highcrest Construction. The check is dated August 7th, 2012. Okay. And it says, fifth payment, 40,000 so far. Okay, 40,000 okay. so far. And do you recall, 
making notes like that to document the progress of the West 5th unit? I don't recall. And then if you look at check number or document number 1105, 1105, there's a check dated August 25th to Highcrest Construction for $8,000. All right. So combined, oh. Oh, go ahead. so combined, if you combine those two checks, the amount paid to Highcrest Construction through August 25th, 2012, pretty much matched the amount of money on the invoice at 160. So would you agree with me that as far as the work that's reflected on that invoice, right, that that work was completed by August 25th, 2012? I don't remember there were progress payments and then weren't there additional checks and additional, additional invoices after that 47,000? I mean, and, and there's definitely additional work. I mean, I know I see checks for planter boxes and some miscellaneous things, but I'm just talking about that invoice. The invoice is $47,800. Through August 25th, you paid approximately $48,000. So my question to you regarding that invoice is, isn't it true that by August 25th, 2012 that the work that 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 Highcrest was going to perform as reflected in that invoice was completed. I don't know. I really don't remember. I just know there was additional work that went on through January of 2013 and that's when the job was finished. Yeah. I mean it would be absolutely impossible for uh, him to finish all that work, three kitchens, a bathroom, and stuff like that in a two-month period. Yeah. I mean, but you're not disputing. I mean, from, from September through January, when you were in California, and we talked, we looked at the, at all the red, you were in that West Fifth Street home, true? Correct. When I visited, I stayed there, correct. And it, it, it got better and better and better as time went on and much more livable. I got Pretty you. much when, yeah, uh, And now maybe this check will help your memory a little bit. On August 29th, uh, and this is document in number 1110, there's a check for $440 made pay payable to Mary Maids. And do you recall hiring Mary Maids to perhaps come in and clean that West Fifth Street apartment? I do not. There's a, if you go to document in, in number 1121, I know you can't, but for those of us who are 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 are, are trying to do our best, there's a check made to uh, Erica Machado for two hundred eighty three dollars, and it says to reimburse car registration. And you know what that was for? Maybe I was going to pay for Kylie's car registration, and she laid out the money, and I paid. I paid, repaid her. That's the only thing I can think of. Okay, and when you go through your Bank of America statements. Each month, there's a, a debit for a payment for a Volkswagen. Whose Volkswagen that was, was it? That's hers? That was Kylie. Right. So was that vehicle in, in, in your name and you let her use it, or was that strictly in her name and you had co-signed on the loan? I didn't co-sign on anything. I believe her mother co-signed. I was just paying the payment for her to help her out. Now, after the sale, there was a bunch of items and that were up for consignment. I mean, when, when, when was the majority of 
of that estate sale completed? You have an idea? So this was a confusing item, but I know this pretty well. I do remember. So the the exclusive neighborhood I lived in did not allow estate sales. Mm -hmm. So Michael, Michael, the estate sale guy, had to take all the items out of there and filter them into different sales around. And I think they just, they started in mid December and ended in late January. So, but he did pick up the furniture in mid October. And it's also my understanding. I looked at a check. It's document in, in, in number eleven thirty-five to to your brother Larry Beckwith. Did 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 he sneak a couple of his items into your uh, estate sale? That's correct. And and you cut that check for oh. him on on December twenty fourth, which means that at least his his items sold before then, right? I don't remember when his items sold, but when I, when they did, I gave him the money. I re, I gave him the money for that. I got gotcha. you. Now now when it comes to the the beer garden in in Nashville, um, did you ever? Hire an attorney to form some type of a business entity for the, the for that. I never got that far. To be How honest. about a bank account? Did you open up a bank account that that you can dedicate to to that project? Never got that far. Um, did you um, hire a person to do a logo or design? Not that things? I remember. We worked on the menu and the, the uh, did, I don't know if Robert gave a copy of that, but there's a copy of the menu and uh, the, the concept and discussed it a lot on looking for location, but that's as far as it got. All right. On, if you go to document in, in, in number 1136, I'll describe it into you, but if you go to document in, in, in number 1136, 36, there's a, a check and it's made payable to One West Bank, One West Bank. And the date on, on that check is January 3rd, 2013. January 3rd, the 20th, the 5th, the 13th, which happens to be the day and, and that you concede you, and you became a California resident and also the day and you came back from Mexico, true? Right. right. Isn't the purpose of this check to open up a bank account for your restaurant project? I don't believe so. I don't remember, to be honest with you. I think I got a, you mean the restaurant project in Los Angeles? Yes, the restaurant project in Los Angeles. The, the one oh, West no, bank account. It was not planned. It wasn't even planned by then, I don't believe. But yeah, I mean, I started talking about that. I believe, the best of my memory, I didn't even start talking about that. I believe we started construction late April of 2013. But I don't, I don't, I don't remember what that was for that bank account. Hold on one second. Now with your, your, in your restaurant project, what bank did you use to, um, um, uh, for your banking the purposes? for that project? There was a bank attached to the uh, restaurant. It was a Chase Bank. It was in the same building. There were three buildings next to each other, our restaurant, Chase Bank, and a place and another restaurant. It was in the old Brown Derby business. And, right. and I remember it was convenient to have the bank right next door. That's all I remember. Right. So, I don't know what so, that other account was. Right. So when did you open up that restaurant? The best of my memory, 
open up. It was sometime in 2014, I believe, first quarter 2014. It took a long time to get it going with permits and build out. It was a full build out. It was basically a basement that was turned into a restaurant. I got you. Now, if you go to check number 1905, that's a check written to, and it's dated, um, excuse me, if you go, to, it's, it's documented in, in number 1147. It's a check dated April 6, 2013, and it's to a gentleman named Albert Salvera. Who's Albert D. Salvera? Albert Salvera was like a consultant and um, chef that was helping me with the concept. Um, and he decided to take a job in New Orleans at another restaurant and not proceed with me. But he had a lot of experience in the restaurant business. Right. And that's and a a for deposit, for menu, et cetera. Correct. He was working on concept for menu. Great. And then there's a check. It's, it's documented in, in number 1162. And it's a check to Elkins called wine, the, wine, the Wine Trop. Um, and, and aren't they the company or the law firm and that helped you establish the, the LLC that, that your restaurant became? Correct. And it's my understanding that at first, when you opened up your LLC, it was it was HDS 2013 LLC. Does that sound about right? No, that wasn't. That was that was a property I was looking at purchasing for investment. That wasn't anything. Okay. That, I, that was a different property. Maybe okay, maybe I didn't. Use, it's possible I didn't use that name and I changed changed that use LLC and changed the name. That's possible. I don't remember. Okay, because because there's a, when you go to the California Secretary of State's web the website, it shows a change and it's, it's it says that the HDS 2013 was formed in March 2013. And then there was a name change to SM uh, SOM Properties. Yeah, that was a building I bought. Uh, That's an apartment building I bought. Okay, gotcha. So neither HDS or HMO have anything to do with with um, um, your the restaurant? restaurant? No, it was 4,500 Los Feliz Boulevard LLC was the, was the LLC that was the restaurant. I gotcha. And then, um, um, who's Jill Canella? Oh, she was working on the uh, logo and uh, design for a logo for the restaurant. Right. She was a graphic. And approximately what time, what time frame did you engage Ms. Canella to help you with the logo and the design? I have no idea. I really don't. If you go to check number 1167, shows checks made payable to her starting in May 6, 2013. Does that sound about right? That does, yeah. Uh, that she probably worked on the logo in May of 2013. Great. And then check number 1163, this checks made out to Brian in the, the, the Winters for just restaurant. I mean, was he involved in the restaurant process in early 2013? He was the architect. So I guess the point I'm making is, you know, soon after um, uh, January, you, and you have multiple expenses, documented expenses reflecting uh, work and progress on on what became, is it stamp market or stamp? Stamp proper foods. Stamp proper foods. Um, but I don't see anything similar to that expense-wise in 2012 related to any projects in, in Nashville. So would you agree with me that at least by early 2013, that your stamp proper foods project was further along than any restaurant project in Nashville was at any time in 2012. Well, I didn't have anything to do with Eco Energy anymore, and I had a lot more time on my hands to, to concentrate and focus. I got you.
Um, at page number 2774, there, um, 2774 is essentially uh, the, the agreement that Copper, Sucor, and EcoEnergy engaged in on, 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 um, on uh, uh, November 1st. Um, and there's a reference to a, a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, and if you look at 27 to 74, it says that in April, April 2012, that both Cooper Secor and Eco Energy entered into a non-disclosure agreement. Do you recall that? I do not. Okay. So if Copper Sucor and Eco Energy engaged in this type of agreement, wouldn't you agree with me that the due process Actually, uh, re regarding the sale, actually started in April. I don't believe so. No. And it's also my understanding that soon after November first, uh, twenty twelve, that both. Eco Energy and Copper Sucor um, uh, sent out press releases announcing the the in the deal that was struck between the two parties. Does that sound familiar? That's possible, but I don't I don't remember that at all. Okay, J and just give me a minute here. I just want to go over with the, over my notes, but that may be maybe everything. Thank you. Bear with me for a moment. Thank you. Do you, this is, I think this is the last the question I have. I have. Do you recall the name of the restaurant that actually occupied the space that you looked at um, in the in, in the Gulch area of Nashville? It, it wasn't. There was no occupying yet. It, it ended up being an Italian place. When we didn't take it, they opened an Italian place under M Street, but I don't remember. Okay, and, and, uh, and, do you know, and do you know the name of the Italian place? I don't. Benji Walker, well, he's he's one of the witnesses. You could ask okay. him because he's part of M Street, so you could ask him. I don't. He, he's part of M Street. Yes, he owns part of it. It's a small. Right. That's all I have. Thank you. I again, I apologize for miss pronouncing in your name and um that's okay right. i've probably been called personally <laughs> then thanks. backwards thanks i'm going to check in with my panel and then we're going to take a break because i think we all need a little bit of a break so um let's start with judge right now do you have any questions for mr beckwith this is judge right now and i do not have any questions thank you very much Thank you. Judge Lambert, do you have any questions for Mr. Beckwith? This is Judge Lambert. Uh, I don't have any questions at this time. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beckwith. We're going to take a 15 minute break. Remember, please do not oh. um, exit the, the session here. Just mute your microphone and stop your video. Um, and then we'll be back in 15 minutes, which should be around. Oh. Or. 15, yes. Mr. Horowitz. Okay, Your Honor. Um, yes. Will I get an opportunity to redirect? Yes. But 
I'm assuming it's gonna, it's already been over an hour and a half, so I wanna take a break. Okay. And uh, then- If I charge my connection, do you know? Sorry? If I charge my phone, would I ruin my connection in any way? I don't think so, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so let's meet back. And then, um, Mr. Horowitz, we're just now 4 o'clock, it'll be 4.15. Um, did you plan on calling your next witness, Mr. Oh, Khan, Mr. Khan? Mr. Horowitz, can you hear me? Did you already mute? Oh, I had sent him an email when Mr. Um, Hofstadt said that he would probably go till almost six o'clock with cross-examination of Mr. Beckwith that I had sent them emails about Mr. Khan and Mr. Walker about whether they would be available tomorrow. Um, Mr. Walker replied that he would be and that it available at 9.30. I'll contact Mr. Khan to see if he'd be available at 4.30. That'd be like great. Yeah, let's do planned. that. Yes. Okay. Mr. Khan at 430 or thereabouts. Okay, great. All right. We'll see you okay. in 15 minutes. Thank you, everybody. All right. Don't Thank leave. You. Just mute. Thank you. So just to recap before we begin, we're going to finish redirect with Mr. Beckwith. And then I'm going to try and keep this really quick so we can move on to Is Mr. Khan... I emailed Mr. Khan and he responded that he is, hold on one second. Mr. Khan responded that I'm on now, do I get off? Oh, um, no, I think we can, I mean, we'll probably have at least 15 minutes, maybe less, depending on how far you want to go with Mr. Beckwith, but we spent a lot of time with him, so. I'm going to have you really focus your questions on things we have not covered. Um, okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. And then, okay, timing. I'm gonna check my timers here. I think Mr. Horowitz, you're at 44 minutes I have. You've used 44 minutes of the time that you have. So let's start with, all right, let's go back on the record. All right, we're back on the record for the Beckwith hearing. Mr. Horowitz, would you like to begin redirect? You yes, are at 40, you, you have Honor. used, you're welcome. You have 44 minutes you have used 44 minutes of the time thus far, just to remind you. Okay. Mr. Beckwith, on direct examination, um, Mr. Hofstow asked you about the fact about the fact that you were making online bill payments as reflected by your bank statements. Do you recall that? I can't, are you muted or? Robert, can you hear me? Okay, now I think you can hear me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Do you recall Mr. Hofstow asking you about the fact that as shown on your bank statements, um, you were able to make payments online? Yes, I do. And the bank statements that it referred to for November was addressed to you at the King Arthur Circle address. It was November of 2012. Why were you having your bank statements and credit card statements sent to the King Arthur Circle address? Because that was still my primary residence. Um, Mr. Hofstow referred you to page 2767, which was the color calendar for 2012. And 
pointed out that between mid-April, from mid-April on, you spent more time in California than in Tennessee. Do you recall that? I recall him showing me the calendar, yes. And why were you in California on those days? I was visiting. Okay, and was it your intention when you were visiting in California to stay there permanently? Not at that point, no. And was it your intention to, when you were visiting in California, did you intend to return to Tennessee? Yes. Um, Mr. Hostel also, also, also asked you about um, checks to Highcrest um, through August of 2012. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Um, document 1130 in the exhibit binder is a check dated November 7, 2012 to Centra Pope Pro Painters for $2,250. And the memo line reads additional deposit Balance equal twenty two fifty. What was Central Pro Painters? They were the person who painted the uh, the house on Fifth Street. Sort of Pro Painters. And eleven thirty one is a check dated November fifteenth, twenty twelve, to High Crest Crest Construction for twelve hundred and fifty dollars. And the memo line says one half deposit. What was that check for? I don't remember, but I would assume work around the house on Fifth Street, but I don't remember in detail. Where was High Crest in November 2012 doing any work for you besides Fifth Street? Uh, not, no. They did do the restaurant, but that didn't start till, you know, somewhere near mid 2013. Document exhibit binder page 1132 is a check to Rubik Abrami. Who is Rubik Abrami? He's the owner of High Crest Construction. And that check is dated November 27th, 2012, and is in the amount of 1250. What would you have written a check to Mr. Abrami in November uh, 27th, 2012 for? <laughs> Work at Fifth Street as well. That was probably the second half. What was LF4500 Los Feliz LLC? That was, well, that was the LLC for the restaurant stamp proper foods that I opened. And when did you locate the pro property that had the that the restaurant opened at? I'm just guessing, I would think somewhere in the approximately April of 2013. Now then, Mr. Now you had mentioned on direct ex examination that um, Mr. Shermay had prepared a menu for the restaurant that the Blue Correct. Club and Correct. now then, Mr. Hofstel referred you to document 1140, 1147, I believe, which was a check to Albert Silvera for deposit for menu dated April 6, 2013. Would that indicate that it's not uncommon to have someone develop a restaurant for a, a menu for a concept restaurant? That would be correct. Okay, now he, Mr. Hofstel also asked you about a check in May 2012 to Ms. Fry for insurance. Do you recall that? I don't recall specifically, but I would assume that that was what the check was for, for insurance, for her okay. insurance, insurance. Okay. 
document 1153 is a check dated April 13th, 2013, made payable to Ms. Fry in the amount of $10,000, um, and it says gift. And then 1156 is a check in, second check dated April 17th, 2013, to Ms. Fry for $4,000. Um, memo line reads for addi additional gift, 10,000 plus 4,000. What were those checks for? Uh, we were engaged and we broke up and I was supporting her. So it was to get her life started without me, uh, first and last months for apartment and furniture, a bed and so forth. It was just to get her life started. It was a gift to get her life started without me. Okay, I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Beckwith. Mr. Hostel, did you plan on recross or are we finished with Mr. Beckwith for today? I'm sorry, we can't hear you, Mr. Hostel. I'm sorry. Um, um, uh, I'm finished with Mr. Bad to Beckwith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beckwith. Thank you for your patience. Well, thank you. That was, that was tough. I'm, I'm exhausted. <laughs> we appreciate all the time you've given us today. Well, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Mr. Horowitz, did you plan on calling um, Mr. Uh, Chad Khan as your second witness? Yes. I guess, like I said, he sent me an email that he's already on. Okay, Mr. Khan, can you hear us? This is Judge Hosey. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I, I got my camera on now. Hopefully you can see me as well. Yes, I can see you. Can you see all of us? I can, yes. Okay. Mr. Horowitz is planning on asking you some questions and then Mr. Hofstel, I believe, will be doing your cross-examination. And then the judges, Judge Reidenauer, Judge Lambert, and I may have questions for you thereafter. Okay, sounds good. All right, Mr. Horowitz, I have you at 52 minutes used so far. Oh, Mr. Khan, I'm gonna swear you in before you begin. I was just gonna let Mr. Horowitz know his time. Okay. Can you please uh, raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Horowitz, you may begin when you're ready. Okay. Mr. Khan, what's your occupation? Um, well, I, I work for Eco Energy. Um, I do, I'm both the corporate counsel as well as the vice president of distribution. And when, you, when did you graduate law school? May of 1999. And when did you join Echo Energy? May of 2007. And what did you do between law school and Echo Energy? Uh, I was in the um, Air Force uh, Judge Advocate Corps for eight years. Okay, now you mentioned that you are um, general counsel to Echo Energy, and also, if I understand, head of logistics. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, that, that's that's correct. I'm uh, I'm in charge of. I've had a couple different roles. I've been there now for 15 years, um, but uh, today I'm head of the asset development group. Okay. Now I want to direct your attention to 2012. You were working at Echo Energy that time. Yes, I was. And did you, where were your offices located? Our offices were located at um, 500 Cool Springs Boulevard, Franklin, Tennessee. And did you have an office at the Echo Energy headquarters? Yes, I did. And did Mr. Beck, David Beckwith also have an office at Echo Energy? Yes, he did. And where was his office in relation to yours? 
my office was uh, in the in the kind of the center of the, I guess the floor. We took up the the entire fifth floor, um, where the trading I guess the trading area is. It's one of the offices that was out with all of the individuals doing logistics as well as the biofuels traders. And where was your office in relation to David Beckwith's office? So David's office was located on kind of the other side of the floor. There was an executive wing that was accessible. Um, I mean, it was the same, you came up the same elevator, but you went a uh, different direction and it was uh, um, kind of a separate part of the separate part of the floor that you, um, you know, you could access that it was open, but it was uh, in an area that, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to see from my office if that helps. Okay. Did you regularly go into that section? Oh, I did. Yes, absolutely. It was where the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, and then um, both Beckwith brothers, David and Larry, had an office there. Okay. Did you interact much with either David or Larry in 2012? In 2012, David and Larry were both, um, uh, they were you know, owners of the company. They were kind of in an advisory capacity at that time. So, when I would see them periodically when they came in or when we were when we were planning a, a big meeting. But on day to day, not as much in 12. Okay, now then in 2012, Echo Energy um, entered into negotiations with Koper Sucre. Uh, that that's correct. Uh, it was a it was a bigger process that involved um, I mean, a lot of individuals at that time, but uh, Copa Sucre was the uh, the company that then ended up, um, I mean, coming into specific negotiations with, if that helps. I mean, we had a private equity, or I'm sorry, we had an investment banker kind of lead us through the process. And that was Piper Joffrey? That is correct. What is Copa Sucre? What type of company is it? Copa Sucre is a Brazilian um, cooperative. It's own, uh, owned by 30 mills in Brazil. Uh, they are the 100% owner of Eco Energy today. Um, and we were kind of, we are their North American arm. And in 2012, when Eco Energy entered into negotiations with Copa Sucre, what was Copa Sucre's line of business? Uh, they're sugar as well as ethanol. Um, they have they have a lot of businesses throughout the world, but primarily sugar and ethanol. And at the time they entered into negotiations, Copa Sucre entered into negotiations with Echo Energy. Did Copa Sucre have a American division? Uh, no, they did not. Were you personally involved, part of the team that negotiated the agreement between Copa Sucre and Echo Energy? I was not part of the negotiation team, but I was part of the due diligence team. And when, what were your duties as part of the due diligence team? It was uh, some, it was collection of contracts. Um, you know, many of the deliverables that we had was uh, not only operational contracts, but also any, any pending legal matters were things that we needed to, um, you know, turn over, explain to them the status of. Also, again, I was, I was the head of the development, terminal development program, even at that time, although we only had one asset, uh, but we had hopes to build a lot of assets and I was part of the team that would um, discuss that with them as well as I did several site visits with members of Copa Sucre to where we would like to build terminals in the future. Okay, and did you, who else was part of the due diligence team at Copa Sucre, at Echo Energy? So, Chad Martin was the CEO at the time. He was um, extremely involved in the process. Uh, so was Gwen Tan, and Gwen Tan was the chief financial officer as well as the chief operating officer. He was my boss at the time. Um, they were the 
main individuals, but then there were several of us um, at the vice president level that were part of the, whether it be collection of documents or, you know, the, the things that were necessary in order to prepare to close. We were also involved in the process leading up to that when it was, um, I mean, again, it was a bid process. So there were, um, you know, people in and out of the office throughout the summer and fall um, as several different companies uh, considered whether they were going to purchase eco energy. Um, and there was a agreement entered into between eco energy holdings, its shareholders and Copra Sucre effective as of November 1, 2012. Do you recall that agreement? I do. And when was that agreement signed? Do you know? It was in late October, I believe is when it was, uh, executed um, 2012, October, late October, 2012. Now then what were, now then do you have access to the exhibit binder? I think I sent you a link yesterday. I do. Could you turn to page 78 of the exhibit binders? I, I can just uh, give me a second. Okay. It's taking a bit, sorry. It, um, I tried to download it earlier, but it was a pretty large file. Okay, I'm looking at page 78. It's article 10, section 10.1, conditions, closing conditions, the buyer. Do you know what section one deals with? Section 10.1? Sorry, it, uh, it's having, I'm having a hard time uh, seeing it. I'm unfortunately having to use my phone um, because, well, because I'm on the computer and I'm traveling right now. Um, but I believe that, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, that was the, um, where we had a list of deliverables in order that we had to meet before closing. And were any of these deliverables met prior to the signing of the agreement? Um, not to my knowledge. I mean, that was, that was part of the process is that we had to, uh, these, I mean, there, there could have been some that were in process, um, but it was ultimately, it was ultimately up to us between the time of execution and signing the document to ensure that all of these were done in a way that was satisfactory to Copa Sucre per the agreement. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll represent to you that. Um, 10.1A states that taken as a whole, all representations and warranties set forth in articles six and seven shall be true and correct in all material respects at and as of the effective date and at and as of the closing. Um, and do you recall what, what had to be done with respect to um, ensuring that all of the representations and warranties, and I believe Article 6 are representations and warranties of the shareholders of Echo Energy, and that is at page Okay. Do 
the representations and warranties of the shareholders, Article 6, as at page 46 and through the beginning of page 48, and the Articles 7, representations and warranties regarding holdings and its subsidiaries are at Article, begins at page 48 and goes through page 60. Seven. Um, so, do you recall what specific were you involved in um, ensuring that any of the articles and warranties were true and correct? Um, I was not involved in that. I was involved in part of the process of us having to get certain things in order to either execute the document or close the document. Specifically, the the thing that I remember that we were the most um, interested in is getting our alliance plants um, the plants that we market for they had clauses within their contracts that uh, allowed them to exit the marketing agreements if um, we had a change in ownership of more than 51 percent and so we had to get permission from each and every one of our plants that they agreed to not exercise that option um, upon the upon the sale that was the that was one of the the biggest deliverables that I know that we were we were all involved in in one way or another. And how many alliance plants were there at the time of the sale to Copper Sucre? I don't know the exact number. I would say it was between six and ten. And. How long was the, the process to obtain the um, consents from the alliance plants? The process started um, in the fall, uh, even before I think this document was signed. And it was, um, you know, it went, I can't tell you, you there's probably, um, you know, whatever the consents, they would have been written consents that would have been uh, provided from each plant. Um, and I, I don't know the exact dates of when those were all all completed. And how long did the due diligence process take? Well, what I consider the due honestly, we started the due diligence process in probably early summer of 2012 because we we're being advised by Piper Jeffries that there were going to be certain things that were going to be required because obviously um, much of these things made for the, uh, the, you know, got to the value of the company. So we started the process early on, uh, you know, everything from real estate documents to contracts to permission from the Alliance plants uh, were obtained starting in the summer and, um, you know, all the way up until you know, my involvement was all the way up until the fall. Okay, and how long did the due diligence process with respect to the closing? The closing was on December 19th, 2012. How long did the due diligence process go up, go before, when was it completed with respect to the closing? So I wouldn't have an exact date of when that would be. I mean, it was always explained to us that there was a exit clause within the contract that they did not have to close if anything changed up until the date of closing. So um, we were obtaining those documents. We were also, um, you know, ensuring that nothing changed once this document was executed uh, until it closed, because again, um, while I wasn't involved in all the specifics of the agreement, it was always explained to us that there was the ability to exit if anything materially changed prior to close. Okay, and did that have any effect on the operations of Echo Energy? What do you, can you explain that again? Um, well, was could echo what specifically was echo energy prohibited from doing during after the agreement was entered into 
Um, it would be contained in the document. I don't, I mean, it's been, um, it's been a number of years since, uh, since I was involved in this, but, um, it was my understanding that it was really just supposed to be business as usual and anything material that would occur between execution and close could potentially, if it rose to a letter level of materiality would be a cause for Copa Sucre not to close. So, I mean, anything operationally, I mean, if something was to happen, um, you know, catastrophically with regard to the operations, if maybe an alliance plant was to uh, decide not to give us that authority or was decide to withdraw their earlier consent, it would be a cause that would potentially um, allow Copa Sucre not to close. Okay, now at the time that um, Echo Energy entered into the agreement with Copa Sucre, did it have any terminals? We did. We had one terminal located in uh, Denton, North Carolina at the time. We also had options on property located in Cartersville, Georgia. And were at the time that the deal was entered into with Copper Zucker, was Echo en Energy in the process of acquiring the property in Georgia? We had an option on the property. Um, so, yes, we were in the process of that purchase, but we did not actually purchase the property until after the sale. It was in early 2013. And why was the property not purchased until after the sale? Um, to be honest, um, I, I'm not entirely sure um, why it is that we didn't. I think that it was a lot of the, you know, the, a lot of the justification for the sale was our terminal development plans and they uh, existed far further than just the one in Cartersville, Georgia. And that was, you know, that was kind of the genesis of the, uh, the process to begin with, that we were wanting to grow the asset division. Uh, it was going to be uh, a lot of money over multiple years and um, we needed or wanted a, a partner that was gonna help uh, fund that program. Okay, if any of the representations or warranties of holdings were not true and correct in any material regard, could Coper Sucre have terminated the agreement? Yes, that was my understanding. And if a material representation or warranty was not met, oh, um, if any condition, were, was Echo Energy, were any conditions placed on Echo Energy? as part of the deal that it had to meet? Uh, yes, I mean, within the document, there were certain requirements that we had to meet for closing. Not only was it operational in nature, but it was, um, uh, you know, there, it, it's in the document. I mean, there was, a, there was a list of things that we needed to do as any transaction of this size we would be required. And as of the completion of due diligence, was closing of the deal a certainty? It was it's certainly not my understanding that that was the case. It was it was my understanding that if well, it was my understanding that there was money that was put into escrow by Copa Sucre, um, and they would lose the escrow money if they did not close um, unless it was something material. And if it was material, they had the ability not to close and get their escrow money back. Well, so that until closing the deal was not final, was not a certainty? That, that is my understanding. Okay, now then did Copert Sucre's acquisition of Echo Energy require the approval of any government entities? It did not in the United States. I'm not positive if Brazil had any, um, any hoops that they had to jump through. Were you present at the closing? I was not present. I think that the um, the actual closing was done at a law firm in Nashville, Baker Donaldson. I was part of um, uh, the, I think that there was a dinner afterwards that I was present for, but not at the actual signature. Okay, I have nothing further.
Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and Mr. Cohen, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Oh, great. <clears throat> can you tell me, um, and just for clarification, I, I know it was two hats, but what were the two positions you had for Eco Energy in 2012? Well, see, I was hired as the director of legal and business affairs. And again, it was a small company, so mm -hmm. especially in 2007. So you wore a couple of different hats. While Once I uh, was hired, I started to get involved in the operations. And by 2012, my title was vice president of operations. Uh, and it included some corporate counsel duties. Now, when you participated in the, in the closing of this deal, did you do so as vice president of operations or did you have more of a legal role in looking at the documents and making sure that everybody was in compliance? No, for, the, for, the, the, for this transaction, I was almost strictly as the vice president of operations. To include now, the terminal development program that we great. were about to start. Great. Now, if you had to identify all of the people who were more knowledgeable about this transaction than yourself, I mean, how how high would that list be? I mean, how, how many people would be on it? You mentioned Larry Beckwith. You mentioned Chad Martin. Gentleman named, is it, is it Gwen Tun? Tan? Gwen Tan, yes, that is correct. Um, a gentleman named Heckman. I'm not sure what his first name is. I saw that name somewhere around. A guy named Pennington. Is there anybody else who would have more knowledgeable on, on this transaction than, than the people I just named and yourself? Uh, we were, um, as you see, we were using Baker Donaldson as our um, outside counsel at the time. Mm -hmm. And the lead um, attorney that was helping us through this process was, was Tanya Grendon. Okay. Gotcha. And as far as your role in in the closure of this deal, it seems like it was somewhat li 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 limited. Would you agree? I was involved in the process through, you know, I mean, it was, I guess it almost absorbed all of our lives for ab about six months. Um, but I was definitely involved in the due diligence, the collection of operational documents, some legal with regard to, you know, pending matters that we had. We had nothing of significance, but, um, but yes, as far as the, the signing and negotiations, that would have been um, others. And, and with regards to the role you had, did you have any issue in, 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 in getting the documents that Cooper Sucre wanted or doing the deals with the different terminals or whatever, you know, I mean, did you have any hangups that prevented you from fulfilling your obligation and your role in this closure? Uh, no, there was nothing that, um, that I was specifically tasked with that we were not able to obtain. Um, again, it was a lot primarily around the land uh, yeah. as well as the operating terminal. And I was involved with the um, documents with regard to the Alliance plants, but more on the periphery because I am, that would have been the vice president of um, Alliance relations, who was John Bowman. He would have been involved as well. Great, great. So um, uh, for the most part, if you had to put a, you know, and we know that they signed in this contract on or about in November 1st, true, of 2012? Yes, I, I I saw that date. Um, I, I believe it was just a few days before that. Um, okay. But again, I, I, just, I remember it being late October. Right. So with regards to the stuff that you had to do in order to get this deal closed, how close to that November 1st date were you complete with all the tasks that you had to complete? I believe that I was able to collect everything that I needed um, to satisfy uh, my portion, my portion with regard to real estate. I can't speak to whether we had all of the plant documents or not at that time. It, if not, it was in process. Okay. So by November first, your your element or your part of due process was already complete. To the best of my knowledge, it was. Great. And are you aware of any other? entities or groups that had portions of this due process? Are you aware of anybody having any 
hangups or issues with regards to not having their portion of due process done by November 1st. I can't speak for the exact dates when we obtained all the marketing agreements, but um, there were a few, uh, I mean, it took, uh, it took a little bit of negotiation with some of our plants. Um, as you can imagine, we represent a lot of plants located in the Midwest United States and um, uh, Brazil is the, was thought of at that time as kind of uh, the competitor. So uh, we were, you know, getting plants in the Midwest to agree to have a Brazilian company market their product. So that was something that took time and energy. Now, this was kind of a big deal though. I mean, this was making Cooper Sucre the largest ethanol producer or, or ethanol distributor in the, in the world, wasn't it? Yeah, um, it, that was, that was certainly, um, if not the, if not the biggest, certainly close. Yeah. And there was a lot of desire on both sides on copper sucre side and on, on eco energy side to get this deal done. True. Certainly on our side, I, I would, um, I would be assuming, uh, with regard to them, but it, it's a pretty safe assumption that they wanted this done. Yeah. Um, now. If, if, if you can get into your documents, if you can, if you can get to document number 2774. Can you, uh, what page is that? Uh, 2774. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm having a hard time getting there. Yeah, that. no, no problem. Maybe I'll just, we, we've had hard, yeah. uh, problems with, with the exhibits. I'll read it to you. If, if you understand the section I'm talking about, great. If not, you can pull it up and look at it. But um, it talks about a confidentiality agreement and, it's, and, 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 and this is actually in, in the document we've been talking about, the membership interest purchase agreement. And it talks about a confidentiality agreement and it says, you know, it's in the definitions section and it says, Confidentiality, uh, this confidentiality agreement means the mutual non-disclosure agreement dated as of April 5th, April 5th, 2012, between Copper Sucre SA and Eco Energy. Okay. Um, it, 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 it was it, so uh, just to clarify, so we had a relationship with Copa Sucre from a purchase and sale side. Um, as well, I don't know if that confidentiality agreement is with regard to this deal or if it was with regard to the purchase and sale of product. We typically, um, well, I'm sure we would have had one for this deal, but at the same time, we would have done it for the purchase and sale as well. Great. So, so there, and there was a relationship between Copper Sucre and Eco Energy prior to November 1st, obviously, and, and even before apparently April 5th in 2012, true? Uh, yes, we did sell Copa Sucre product. Um, we would typically take it to the uh, Texas City, Texas, and they would buy it FOB Texas City from us. And again, I do believe that that started in the spring and summer, and that led to the relationship that ultimately resulted in the sale. Right. So you agree with me that you weren't two strangers at this particular point. By November 1st, your two entities or two entities that, that knew each other fairly well, true? We had definitely got to know each other. I don't know if I was involved with Copa Sucre in uh, April, but by by early fall, late summer, early fall, I was um, involved with them and even doing site visits. Great. Now, in talking to Mr. Bed the Bed the Beckwith earlier, I had asked him about like the expiration of of ethanol, the tariffs, in the end of 2011. Can you know anything about that? Uh, I, well, yes, I'm certainly aware of, um, I'm, I'm certainly aware of that. Yes. Okay. So, so did tariffs expire at the end of 2011? Yes, uh, that is correct. It is correct. All right. And it's my understanding that because of that 
expiring tariffs that this particular deal was thought of, at least by copper sucre, as being highly desirable because they no longer had that tariff burden. Is that is that true? Uh, without a doubt that, you know, prior to that, Brazilian ethanol had a very difficult time making it into the United States. And with the lifting of the tariffs, uh, that changed things significantly. Right. And the lifting of the tariffs was the end of 2011, true? That is that is correct. And did the lifting of the tariffs, did that have anything um, to do with uh, both and Larry and David at Beckworth deciding that this might be the time to sell to sell the company. I don't know. I don't know if that's correct. Um, okay. I, I just know that um, we embarked on that. We actually started talking about the process a few years before, and uh, Gwen Ton was specifically hired as chief financial officer to kind of get us into um, a saleable fashion. I got you. So. A couple of years before the expiration of the tariffs, Eco Energy was kind of putting themselves in position to be a desirable target. Is that a safe bet? We, we certainly started to, to think about that because we, we wanted to branch into the distribution of product and actually have fixed assets. And that was going to require um, significant amounts of capital. I got gotcha. you. Now, um, it's my understanding that both Larry Beckwith and David Beckwith resigned from their active day-to-day -day participation of the company sometime in early 2012. Is that correct? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know when their resignations uh, uh, occurred. They were um, they were involved in the company um, during that time period, but um, you know, day-to-day. Day to day, definitely, um, they would have been not there in, by 2012. Okay. But we would have meetings, um, I mean, on site, which they would be present for. But again, I can't remember the dates. Great. And, and, and Mr. And Mr. Bed, the Bed, the Beckwith had testified earlier that he had a lot of meetings while he was in California over like internet or some type of streaming platform. Do you recall any meetings like that with Mr. Beckwith? Um, well, actually, when I started with the company, um, David lived in California and then subsequently moved to Tennessee. Um, and so there were um, there was times that I remember during that time period that he was we did a lot of conference calls. Um, and then once he moved to Tennessee, um, I, I don't I honestly remember us doing it in that fashion. You know, I, I mean, after he and Larry resigned, do you recall having any any meetings with with David after the resignation? I don't remember offhand, um, but again, it was not it was not abnormal for people to be calling in uh, from different locations, whether they were um, whether they were traveling for work or whether they were on vacation. That was a pretty normal thing to happen. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, and do you know um, from the do you have an idea? Um, well, let me just retract a little bit. I'm trying to avoid showing you a document, but I can't. Um, if, if you could try to pull up 2767, document 2767, and uh, I'll keep my fingers crossed. I'm keeping my fingers crossed all, all, all day here, but I'll, 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 I'll see if you could pull it up. Wish you would ask for document number three. I can get to that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm scrolling as fast as I can. But yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I know uh, it's hard, and, and there might be a search bottom on the bottom, and that's what I kind tried, of. Yeah, I, I tried that. It uh, doesn't seem to be working. Uh, I'll describe the document, and we've all seen it. 
quite yes. a bit he did today. It's, it's basically a physical their, their presence chart that kind of shows Mr. Beckworth's physical presence for day for 2012. And starting about April 16th or so, um, uh, there's a dramatic shift uh, from physical presence from Tennessee to California. And I just wanted to see if that kind of refreshed you in your memory at all as to when, you know, Mr. Beckwith may have resigned. Um, I'm unable to get to the document right now, okay. but I can I can safely say that I would, um, I would have a hard time recalling exactly uh, what he was doing day to day during 2012. I mean, I, I remember seeing him. I remember. You know, there were times that I would um, I would see him in and, in and around the office, but um, yeah. And then on calls, but it uh, but I but I couldn't speak for. Right, and, was, and do you know if that was before or after he was res he resigned? That's what I'm trying to get to. Is just. I really don't. Um, okay. I don't remember the the resignation date. I remember when they they stepped back. Right now, and now getting back to the deal here a little bit. Um, isn't it true that within a few days of entering into this uh, membership purchase agreement on November 1st that both Copper Sucre and Eco Energy had press releases announcing this, this uh, deal? I don't remember. I, don't, I do not know the dates that we press released it, but yes, we did press release it soon, um, soon after the deal was executed. Now, it would have been embarrassing for both Eco Energy and Copper Sucre to have these press releases and then the deal kind of like fall through. I mean, you would agree with that one, right? Uh, it, yes, it, it would have been. I, I know that um, we, we like to press release stuff at Eco Energy, um, you know, one to kind of just send, send a message out to the market. But there's, um, there's no doubt that there would have, it would have taken some backpedaling on our part. Right. I can't right. speak for Copper. Right. And also starting, you know, early November too, this transaction was being reported by a lot of the industry magazines and 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 um, financial companies. True. Yes, there were. Um, I do believe it hit some of the wires. Right. So you would agree with me that by November first, twenty twenty one that this deal was more likely than not going to be completed, true? 2012? Yeah. No, in November 1st, tw tw the, the 2012, when the agreement was signed, do you agree with me that it was more likely than not that the deal between Copper Sucre and Eco Energy would have been um, finalized? It certainly was, in, from our perspective. I mean, it was um, it was something that we knew that we had to we knew that we had a time period between executing and close that we had nothing was to go wrong and we were to make no sudden movements, I suppose you would say. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, yes, it was our opinion that we um, were marching towards that, that date when it would be closed. Right. Um, was there any, did, did you have any doubt that the deal would not finalize um, on at the end of December? Uh, well, <laughs> um, I'll, I, from my perspective, um, as, as certain key employees, I was um, going to be uh, given a compensation uh, based upon the close. So mm -hmm. um, as someone that never counts my chickens before they hatch, I certainly was um, uh, very eager for it to close. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um... Now, um, when you look at the agreement, and it's page 2818, I know you can't get to it, but it actually calls for the deal to be finalized by December 27th, 2012. And do, you, and do you recall that the deal was actually supposed to close actually about eight days before it actually did? That it, you said it was supposed to close on December 27th? December 27th, and when you look at page 2018, it talks about the deal, it says the deal should be finalized. You know, the two parties agree that, hey, we have this deal, it needs to be finalized by, and the date they put in there is December 27th, 2012. Do you recall that at all? 
what I remember is that we were um, doing everything we could to make sure that it was closed and really pressing Copasucre to make sure it was done before the end of the year. Right. Mm -hmm. And did the deal actually close sooner than people had anticipated closing? Uh, I do know that it closed. Um, to, I think that you, you mentioned the date. It was um, it was it the 18th or the 19th of December. Right. So yeah. um, I'm assuming that that was um, you know if, you know the transfer of funds that were you know when they were able to be completed. Right. And then um, and Mr. Horwitz had talked about this section earlier. Um, I know you didn't pull it up, but it's like section uh, 10.1 and 10.2. And it's at, at exhibit page 28, the, 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 the 28. But I mean, isn't it? I mean, you know, and just to summarize that, would you agree with me that the closing was pretty much dependent on, at, at, at this point on November 1st, the closing was pretty much dependent on each side doing what they said they were supposed to do? Yes, that's correct. And, um, you're not taking the position at all that at any time between November 1st and December 19th that either Copper Sucre or um, um, uh, Eco Energy uh, failed to perform as they agreed, right? No, not to my knowledge. And um, it also says that that the the closing is somewhat dependent on the party's representations and warranties being true. Is that your understanding? Yes, absolutely. And do you have any reason to believe, or did you have any reason to believe at the time that either side, Eco Energy or Copper Sucre, made a, a material misrepresentation? No. And closing is all is also dependent on there being no judgments, orders, or decrees, and it's my understanding that, and, and that there wasn't any to, to impact this transaction, true? There was not. Other than, we, other than what we just talked about and summarized, is there anything else that, that closing was dependent on other than, other than those few things? Um, not, from, not from my side, I just, um, you know, again, um, I don't want to speak to the intricacies of the document, um, just because, right. again, I wasn't the one that yeah. negotiated it, but. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, and the bottom line is, and, and what I'm getting the feel from your test, the, the, the money is, is on November 1st, this deal was a pretty darn good deal and it was going to get closed because both parties wanted to do so and had incentive to do so. Would you agree with that? I know that we at Eco Energy wanted it done. I. I personally wanted it done, but um, I can't speak for uh, Copa Sucre. I know that they had the ability to exit, um, but there were certain requirements uh, for them to do so. Yeah, and I think that, and that's one of the sections in, in the contract is that in order to exit, um, that, that one party would basically have to, uh, and this is section 28, or page 2830, it talks about that in order to back out, that, and that and that the other party wouldn't have to have a prior material breach and that the other party would have a 30-day cure notice in order to rectify or remedy any um, uh, any uh, um, um, defect. Is that your understanding of the agreement? That is my understanding. I do believe that, um, again, you, we, we couldn't force them to close, uh, but they right. would have lost their escrow money. Yeah. I understand that. So, and it's also my understanding, I mean, that neither e Eco Energy or Copper Sucre invoked that 30 day cure, right? And no nobody noticed each other of a breach and, and invoked in that 30 day cure period, true? No, there was no notices given. I'm just going over my notes here quick to see if there's anything else. I think I appreciate your time and your candor. No problem at all.
I went to school in Nashville, so I. Oh, where at Vanderbilt? Uh, Vanderbilt, yeah, I did. Ready to go? I, I got my my business degree there. So I'm... yeah, great. Yeah, I, I was I was there when they actually the the first year they opened up the business school. <laughs> oh, great! Me well, too. I think it was. Well, it's a beautiful campus. It is. Did you know as as a perk of employment? Um, did um, Eco Energy provide any types of club memberships or anything like that to its its senior senior officers? Club memberships? Yeah, yeah. Like you know, a lot of times you know when you're a president or a CEO of a company, you know, with that you might get a membership to a country club. Or something along those lines. Did, 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 did Eco Energy offer anything like that to its executives? Not that I'm aware of. I believe that we got. Uh, I mean, they 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 provided us uh, you know the ability. I think money to join a health club, but uh, right. but that was for all employees. I hear you. Uh, I'm almost finished. And you talked about a um, um, that, and it was the signing of the agreement, and then there was like a, uh, and it was at a law firm um, uh, in downtown Nashville, and then afterwards there was a dinner. Was that? event was that celebration on on or about November 1st when the agreement was signed or was that when the, everything closed on December 19th I believe, I do know that we had a um how do you see a, there was a dinner in downtown Nashville uh for the life of me I don't remember if it was after close or if it was after uh the signing of the agreement Copasuka mm -hmm. was there there was also a um I do remember though that there was a um there was an event. Um, there were there were two events. I just uh, I don't know if Copasuker was at the um, the one in December. I don't remember. Gotcha. Fair enough. That that's all I have. I I don't know what hotel you're at, but it's beautiful. I hope, <laughs> I hope you're in the sun. <laughs> uh, I'm in the Kansas City Airport Marriott. So oh, no, there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hofstall and Thank Mr. Khan. Mr. Horowitz, did you plan on redirect or are you finished with Mr. Khan for today? Mr. Horowitz? Can you hear us, Mr. Horowitz? Hello, I, um, I have just a few questions for Mr. Khan. Okay, you've talked about Mr. Hofstel, when he was questioning you, you talked about the Alliance plant, and there were concerns, were there not, that some of the Alliance plant may be hesitant about signing on because Copper Sucre was um, a company that was from their biggest competitor country, Brazil? But that's correct. So, um... We discussed earlier when the tariffs were lifted, uh, Brazilian ethanol came in and the price of ethanol was impacted by that. So there was a little hurt feelings in the industry from the producers at that time with regard to Brazil entering the U.S. market. And um, so certainly that was something that we were concerned with and, certain, and some of our plants were concerned as well. And if any of these alliance, of the alliance plants refused to sign on, would that have impacted the closing of the deal? I I don't, I mean, that would have ultimately been up to Copa Sucre. They would have had to provide notice that that rose to a level of materiality. Um, but it was something that we were concerned with. Okay, and that was something that was outside of your control, was it not? Yes, it was. And it was outside of Copper Sucre's control, correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. 
Now then, at page 79, um, it's section 10.1C. It says that since the latest, that one of the conditions of closing was that since the latest balance sheet, no material adverse effect shall have occurred. Um, were material adverse effects outside of the control of Echo Energy? Well, can you rephrase that? I don't um, quite understand. Okay. The section 10.1C of the agreement, which is at page 79, since, that since the date of the latest balance sheet, referring to Echo Energy's balance sheet, no material adverse effect shall have occurred. Right. I don't know if um, if the plant contracts would have been on our balance sheet. I'm not. Um, I'm not sure about that. But were material adverse effects to the balance sheet something that was with totally within Echo Energy's control? No, certainly. I mean, uh, no. That that no. There would there could have been things that happened in any business that would have been outside our control that would have impacted the balance sheet. And another condition um, on the same page, 10.1G says there must not have been any material adverse effects since the effective date. Um, and that's one of Echo Energy's um, conditions for closing that it must fulfill. And again, the a material adverse effect to the company would be something that was beyond the company's control, correct? Well, certainly there, there could have been things that occurred that would be material adverse um, that would have been within our control or as well as outside of our control. The way that I interpreted that would was anything you know significant that happens. I mean, we move a lot of product, we had assets in the ground. So anything that happened during that time period would um, could have resulted in this, um, you know, deal being altered. Now, you mentioned that the company had a terminal in North Carolina at the time the deal was entered into? At the time, the, we had one operating terminal um, uh, at the time of the deal. And um, again, the dates are not... Um, I also believe that we owned a gasoline terminal in Charlotte at the same time. Um, we 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 sold that pretty quickly into the relationship with Copa Sucre, but during the time of uh, that we're talking about, I believe that we had an ethanol terminal in Denton, North Carolina, and a gasoline terminal in Charlotte, North Carolina. And were was ethanol stored at the ethanol terminal? Yes, sir. And was gasoline stored at the Charlotte terminal? At that time, I believe that we um, did have gasoline at the Charlotte terminal. That terminal uh, was only up for a little while. We refurbished it. Um, it you know, I cannot speak with 100% certainty if it had gasoline during this time period, but I can with the ethanol at the Denton one. If between November 1 and the closing date, there had been a major fire at the terminal that caused substantial damage to surrounding areas, would that have been a material adverse effect? It was my understanding that that would be. Okay, I have nothing further. You plan on any yeah, I'll be rather quick. Now, it's my understanding from what you talked about before is that all of the issues regarding the alliance companies was pretty much resolved by November 1st. Isn't that true? I would again, there, there should be some written documents of um, when they actually provided their written consent hmm. uh, because per the alliance agreements, there would have needed to be written consent. Um, hmm. I can't speak if that was before or shortly thereafter. Yeah. So it was but it was that we were definitely talking to them about. Right. But it was well resolved before December 19th. True? Yes, it was. And 
isn't it true that uh, ethanol is a, is, is a commodity? Yes, it is. And it's traded as a commodity? Yes, it is. And it's traded by commodity contracts? Uh, yes, it is. Right. So, for the most part, since it is a commodity and it is dealt with by a commodity contract, the income you would have had that would have affected the balance sheet from, from, from November 1st through December 19th um, would have been immaterial because you've already had all the contracts to deliver during that time, true? Uh, that's true uh, with the, the sale. The, the terminals operate differently, though. Yeah, yeah. But for the most part, because of the fact it is a commodity and you do deal with commodity contracts that are, what are they, like six months out, a year out? How how far out into, into the commodity co the contracts go? Uh, so we, we deal in physical product as a, I mean, we, we also do paper as well. Uh, yeah. But the physical can be uh, everything from, it's very rare to have a year long contract and sometimes we do sell product spot. So it's that day. Yeah. Yeah. But for the most part, the people in your accounting department based on the, on the commodity contracts knew what the balance sheet would be. Probably 2 or 3 months out. True. At least. I, I think that that would be um, that may be oversimplified. I believe that there's a lot of product that we buy and sell on a spot basis. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have the balance sheet, but I assume that the Denton North Carolina terminal would be on there as well. So mm -hmm. that was a fixed asset that uh, mm -hmm. and not trying to uh, just with, but with regard to, I mean, again, because it was my business, I had to be more intimate in it. We certainly. Mm -hmm. um, the balance sheet at that time was not only retained earnings, uh, future contracts, uh, but also the asset. The asset, right. So, as a percentage, what would you say the percentage of contracts versus spot market is as far as as far as sales go? At least at least in October, uh, November, December, twenty twelve. So I would say that at least 90% of our contracts are, 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 of our agreements are, are contracts, you know, for either a one month strip, three month strip or six month strip. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, they're not, they're, they're typically either one or three months. Quarterly is typically how it's done. Fair enough. I'll say this again. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> and I hope you have a pleasant evening. All right. Thank you all. See if my panel members have any questions before you leave. Oh, oh did we lose Mr. Oh, Khan? Um, Judge Reinhardt, did you have any questions for Mr. Khan? Um, this is Judge Reinhardt. Um, thankfully, I did not have any questions for the gentleman. Okay, let me check with Judge um, Lambert. Judge Lambert, did you have any questions for Mr. Khan? This is Judge Lambert. No, I did not. Thanks. Okay, we'll let Mr. Khan go. Um, it's been a lot of time. Okay, we have, let's see, it's 5.30. Mr. Um, Horowitz, did we have um, Mr. Walker on standby? Or is I don't want to interrupt. He had... I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, mean to inter I don't mean to interrupt, but as I was signing off, uh, you asked if uh, I was literally <laughs> pressing the button and you asked if uh, anyone had questions for me, so I thought I would join again. <laughs> Oh, we really appreciate it. No, I checked in with the other judges and right. we didn't have any questions for you, so we didn't want to bother you any longer, but I appreciate you checking back in with us. All right, I'll, I'll sign off for good this time. Thank you. <laughs> have a great afternoon. Take care. Bye. Thanks. All right, Mr. Horowitz, this is Judge Hosey again. Um, did we have Mr. Walker on standby or is he planning on joining us tomorrow um, at 9.30? Um, he was intending to join us tomorrow at 9.30. Josie, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Okay, um, Mr. Walker, <clears throat> was that the last witness you're planning on calling Mr. Horowitz? Yes, it is. 
Okay, and then Mr. Hostel, did you plan on calling any witnesses tomorrow morning? No, I, I think the 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 testimony we've had from both Mr. Beckwith and and um, and Mr. Cohn were, you know, as far as we're concerned, and we don't need any rebuttal and rebuttal witnesses. So we're okay. I, I, think so we're I, think I think we're well on I think we're well on schedule to finish by twelve be tomorrow. Okay, that's what I was concluding as well. I think we'll have plenty of time to have Mr. Walker and then um, our arguments and closing statements tomorrow morning. Let me make sure. Does anybody have any questions before? Oh, I'm being reminded that you need to check your email this evening for a new link for tomorrow morning. Um, this will be a different link for us all to sign on to begin again. Do I have any questions before we um, break for this evening? And then we'll um, start again at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Yeah. Any questions? No, you're all right. right. I will see you. Okay, thank you. I will see you all tomorrow morning at 9.30. Check your email for a new link. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Your Honor. Bye. Bye, go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Walker. This is Robert Horowitz. Prior to Mr. Horowitz, sorry, let me just yes? but we're off the record right now. Let me um let's get us all on the same page and then we'll go on the record and you can begin with Mr. Um, Walker's testimony. Um so I just want to get us on the same page. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Um uh, Mr. Horowitz good morning, Mr. Walker. Good morning. Mr. Horowitz will be calling Mr. Wackel to testify. I have to swear him in and then he'll begin his testimony. Then we'll do a cross-examination and we'll have time for some questions from the judges if there are any. Um, we're well within time. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, you've had an hour and 20 minutes thus far. And um, Mr. Hostel, we have an hour and 30 minutes for you. Then we'll move on to the legal arguments and closings, and then some time for questions from the panel. Are there any questions before we begin? Yes, Judge Hosey, um, it looks like Mr. Walker is on phone, and I was wondering what his access to documents is going to be. So I, I, I do not have access to documents. I, I just tried to click on the link. I'm, I'm working from a my uh, cell phone traveling. Yes, I sent him the link to the documents, but apparently like Mr. Connie's having a hard time accessing it on his cell phone. Okay. It looks like there's limited access, Mr. Hostel. All right. We'll have to work with what we have. So, are there any other questions before we begin? Seeing none, we're now back on the record. This is a continuation for the hearing of David Beckwith. Mr. Horowitz, go ahead and um, we'll call Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker, can you raise your right hand, please? Yes. We're gonna swear you in for your testimony. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Horowitz, you can begin. Mr. Walker, what is your occupation? I am a financial advisor. For, and for whom do you work? UBS. How long have you been at UBS? Since 2008. And could you tell us about your educational background and work prior to UBS, beginning with college? I have a college degree and a master's degree in, in business, MBA. And I started with Merrill Lynch in 2005, uh, was, which was the year I graduated from graduate school. Okay, and do you know David Beckwith? Yes. And how long have you known him for? Uh, I, I believe since around 2010. 
And what's the nature of your relationship with Mr. Beckwith? Uh, we met through mutual friends and have, have been, have had, a, have had a strong friendship since, since we met. And Mr. Beckwith has accounts at UBS, is that correct? Yes. And are you his financial advisor at UBS? Yes. And I want to direct your attention to 2012. Were you in contact with David? In 2012, yes. And how frequently were you in contact? I'd say weekly, if not typically several times a week. And was this in person or phone or email or how did you normally communicate with David? Phone and in person. And you you presently reside in Nashville, is that correct? Yes. And did you and David have friends in common when he was living in Tennessee? Yes. Now in approximately March of 2012, Mr. Beckwith put his home on Vaughn Crest Drive in Franklin, Tennessee on the market. Do you know why he did that? Uh, for my conversations, uh, number one, he lived in the suburbs in the same neighborhood as his brother and his brother's family, who Dave is very close to his brother. Uh, his brother was uh, going through a divorce. And so uh, it, it, living in the suburbs no longer had the value to David as it as it once had. And particularly since he was living alone, uh, I think he felt, uh, you know, he was, it wasn't social enough for him living in the suburbs once his brother was going to move because of his brother's divorce. And after he put his place on Vaughn Crest Drive on the market, did he look for another residence to buy in the Nashville area? He did. I, I lived uh, I lived alone at the time, so I, I was living in high-rise condos in, in downtown Nashville and had for years. So I had some perspective around what each different building was like. And, uh, and Dave would ask kind of my opinion on, on how my experiences have been, where I'd lived, and what I knew about buildings. And do you know for how long were you? Did you ever accompany him when he looked for a new condo and a new home in Nashville? I did. I, I specifically remember going to a building called the Trazo, which is in the Gulch re area of Nashville. Um, I'd lived. Uh, in the building next to it, and uh, I went with him to look at a unit. Do you recall when this was? No. Not okay. exactly, no. Do you, did David look for a place, a condo in Nashville um, throughout 2012? Was he on the lookout for a place in Nashville prior to the sale of Echo Energy? Uh, yeah, so I know we, my, my understanding or memory is, you, you know, we didn't start looking at these condos until he made his mind up to move out of the suburbs, you know, and sell his house. So um, it, it, I believe that would be in 2012, since um, just from the timeline you've given. And um, I know you can't access the computer, but I was refer referencing page 2767 of the exhibit binder, which is what you were sent the link to that you cannot access. And that shows that in October, from October 7, 9th through the 18th, David was in Tennessee. 
do you recall if he looked for a place in that time frame? I I don't recall. Okay, were you aware in 2012 that David was dating a woman in Los Angeles? Yes. And how did you learn that? Uh, we were, David and I were really good friends, so he he shared a lot with me. And uh, so he, he, he verbally told me, and uh, I actually had met her in person in Nashville with him. Is my memory. And were you were you aware in approximately early November 2012 that David became engaged to Miss Fry? Uh, yes, David uh, definitely informed me of his engagement shortly after the date he became engaged. And what was your reaction? I was happy for him. He is. If he was happy, I was happy. Were you aware that David purchased a house in Los Angeles in the, in July of 2012? Uh, yes, I remember. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. At one point, he told me that he had bought a house. I remember talking about a house um, that, that he was looking at buying in, in L.A. So oh, yes. And what what was your understanding of why David purchased the house in Los Angeles? Um, David uh, David's always had an affinity for real estate. He's uh, creative, and you know felt like he had the ability to buy stuff, improve it, and add value to it. So uh, I think he saw some of that was a good deal, and some of that he could make some improvements too and and create value. So uh, I don't think he knew exactly what he was gonna do with it other than fix it up and have it worth more than what he had in it. Now then, are you, you're aware that in 2012, beginning in approximately late, mid to late April, um, David was frequently in California? Uh, I guess I can't specifically remember when he went and didn't go, so I can't really give much context to that. But the, uh, yeah, I mean, I knew he was traveling at a certain point. Did you know he was visiting um, Miss Bray in California frequently in 2012? Yeah. Uh, I, I can't remember specifically other than I know that Dave and I talk frequently, so, so yes, I, if he was there, he would tell me. Okay, fair enough. Um, now then, there can, when, in 2012, were you involved in discussions with David about opening a beer garden restaurant in Nashville? Uh, yes, I, I, I can't remember, I guess, exactly the date. Um, but yes, we were absolutely looking and kind of doing diligence on a concept, a beer garden concept for Nashville that we thought could um, be, be a good business to have. And what was your role to be if this business came to fruition? I, I was a limited partner in another restaurant group in Nashville. So I had, you know, while I wasn't part of operations, I had some uh, experience as a limited investor. And so in this venture that I was looking at with David, I would have been basically just a limited investor that could add some, possibly some context to the, to kind of the, the numbers or the ratios of what it takes to have a concept that it's profitable. And what was your David's role to be if the restaurant concept got off the ground? David would have been uh, David would have been 
running kind of getting the the the, the actual concepts nailed down, you know, the build out and the culture, I guess, of the restaurant, and you know, uh, starting out running the restaurant. Yeah, he'd be, he'd be the operating partner. Was my and was anyone what we who, had who else was involved in the beer garden restaurant project, and what were their roles? Uh, Dean uh, Shermod, if I'm saying that right, he he was going to be my memory. Is, he was going to be the the kind of the chef in charge of the culinary. Um, David's brother Larry had been part of the discussions and and would have been a you know a financial partner. And, and were any all, steps that, that's all. That's all. Yeah. Were any uh, steps taken I'm to? Sorry. Okay. Okay. Can, were you going to say something else, Mr. Walker? No. 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 Okay, were any steps taken to um, go beyond the concept phrase phase? We went and looked at uh, spaces for lease, uh, also in the Gulch area, um, that were close to where the restaurant that I was already a limited partner were in. So, and, and again, I've been living in that area, so, um, you know, had some <clears throat> context or color around the spaces, but yes, we went and looked at uh, several spaces that were available for lease for the restaurant. And was there any space in particular that you recall looking at? Uh, we went to one uh, in the Gulch where, uh, I don't have the address, but there's a restaurant there now called Moto. Uh, we actually looked at that space before Eventually, it was leased to another group, actually the group that I was an investor in. That's one. And then there was a second space kind of on the back side of the gulch now that's, you know, part of retail and vibrant area today. Those are the two spaces I you remember, remember visiting. Do you remember approximately when this was that you were looking at these I, locations? I, I don't. I remember, I remember it was cold. I remember it was cold in the building, like, you know, need a jacket cold, not, not, you know, I remember it was, it was chilly outside. Was David with you when, to, when you went to look at the restaurant location? Yes. Now, as I mentioned earlier, 2767, is October often chilly in Nashville? Uh, yes, it can be. And the, the calendar. Okay, the calendar of Sorry, can you repeat your answer, please, Mr. Walker? Can you repeat the last part of your last answer? I need to. Yes, talk October to you can to be. Talk over each other. Uh, yes, October can be a chilly month in Nashville, particularly on the, in the second half of October. Um, I'm referring to exhibit binder page 2767, which again is the um, calendar of Mr. Beckwith's physical presence. It shows that he was in Nashville between October 9th and October 18th. Would have been in that time frame that you went with him to view Mr. Caden's property? Potentially, I, I don't remember the, the date. And what happened with the um, effort to lease Mr. Caden's space? Uh, well, we were, you know, it was a rather large space. So, uh, you know, and at the time, and it's, you know, it was an area that was popular. So it was a, it was a pretty significant financial commitment to sign a lease and, you know, could we take this, could we utilize the space? Was it the right footprint for what we needed? Um, ultimately, I, there was other people looking at it and it, it was leased. It was, we didn't get the lease. We didn't, we didn't make an offer on the lease, but we were running numbers on it and, and trying to decide if it was going to be a fit for what we wanted to do and, and make sure we had our arms around the significance of it all. And did you, what happened to, you said there was another space 
in the GOATS area you looked at? Yeah, we looked at another space. Uh, it wasn't as, uh, at the time, didn't get as much foot traffic as the first space. Um, and the rent would have been less, but, you know, I remember talking about, you know, is it, is it a good enough space from a visibility standpoint? Okay, and what happened with that space? We we ultimately didn't we ultimately didn't take it. it I mean, it's been now. Um, yeah, yeah, somebody else signed a lease on it at some point. It's a pretty vibrant area today. Did the discussions between you and David continue about the possibility of opening up a restaurant beer garden in Nashville throughout 2012? Uh, I can't remember the exact timelines, but I know Dean came in town. Uh, I believe we all went to dinner uh, to talk about you know, how we would make this work. Obviously, with Dean not living in Nashville at the time, and is everybody committed? And really just brainstorming over, you know, how, how much money would it take to do this right, and um, how much time it would take to do this right, and and are we ready to commit that? Okay, now you're aware that in um, on, our, on November 1, there was, a, there was a membership interest purchase agreement entered into between Echo Energy Holdings and Copra Sucre, effective November 1, 2012? Uh, yes, David shared with me, you know, I was not part of the transaction, so I didn't know, you know, I wasn't privy to any of the details other than David as a friend just sharing with me that, uh, there was, yeah, there was a contract, the potential for a transaction. At, did, were you and David still discussing the potential for a beer garden restaurant after the agreement was entered into with Coper Sucre? Uh, uh, I can't remember exactly all the dates, but I do know that, you know, a potential uh, so I, I don't know, N no, but I, you know, obviously if there was a transaction, there would be more liquid cash to do a restaurant. So, um, but I can't remember exactly when all, when, you know, all the, all the dates of all the discussions were to be specific. Okay. At the, at the time the transaction was entered into, to your knowledge, was David still interested in buying a condominium in Nashville? Uh, yes, I mean, my, my memory was, you know, the transaction just kind of, again, you know, would give him more liquid cash to, you know, buy real estate. So, um, so yes, yeah, so if anything, that, that made it more favorable. Okay, now then, between the time the agreement with Copra Sucre was signed and prior to the time that it closed in December 2012, did you ever have any discussions uh, with David about where he intended to live? No, not that I, not that I remember. Um, you know, I, uh, no. I mean, I, I kind of just uh, assumed that he would be living in Nashville, but no, I mean, not that I remember specifically. Were, how close were you with David at this time? We, I would, very good friends. And what, with, if he intended to move from, to another city, would he have told you? Yes. And now the deal closed for, now then the deal with Coper Sucre, what, to your understanding, was it a certain thing that it would definitely close? Uh, no, I mean, yeah, obviously, again, I wasn't privy to the deal, but from just my conversation with David, uh, you know, any deals always got risk of breaking, and particularly this one, I remember him saying because it was kind of a cross-border buyer, if you will, that, you know, there was, 
even more kind of concerned that something would come up last minute that would break the deal. The deal closed on December 19th, 2012. When did you first learn that David was moving to Los Angeles? Was it before the deal closed or after? I, I can't remember specifically the date he told me he was moving, but what I do remember is being surprised at how quickly he was moving after he told me. You know, basically, like, as a friend, I, you know, I'm not going to get a lot of time to say goodbye um, and spend time with him before he left. So I don't remember the date, but I, I do remember he left what I consider, you know, pretty soon after he told me. The, again, page 2767 in the exhibit binder, the physical presence calendar shows that David was last in Nashville on December 18th through December 21st, and the deal closed on December 19th. Would it have been in that time frame that he told you for the first time that he was moving to Los Angeles? I don't remember when he told me. Would it have been before he left, Na during the, just before he left Nashville permanently? I'm sorry, you said it again. Asked and answered. I know he's trying to get for an answer, but he's asked the same question four or five times now. I think, you know, he's already expressed his opinion. He doesn't know the date. I think we can move on. I don't well, I'm trying to refresh his recollection by um, referencing to the dates when Mr. Beckwith was last in Nashville based on the physical presence calendar. I, but I, I don't believe he testified that he was told in person and that he was leaving either. So I, I think it lacks a little bit of foundation, but if you want to ask one more question and move on, fine, I don't have a problem, but you know, I, I know you're trying to get to an answer, but he's stated numerous times he doesn't know and doesn't recall. All right, Mr. Horowitz, okay, you... let's ask one more time and as best you can, and then we'll move on from there. Okay, Thanks. when Mr. Dave Beckwith told you, was he in Nashville at that time? When he told me that he was moving? Yes. Was he in, I don't, I don't remember if it was in person or on the phone or where he was. Okay, so you wouldn't recall if he was in Nashville between December 18th and 21st, whether he told you during that time frame or before that date or subsequent. I'm going to object again, and um, we gave him another chance to clarify the question. He's already asked and answered the question numerous times. You know, I don't mean to interrupt uh, or anything, but I think he's, he's made his position clear on when he was told. All right, Mr. Horowitz, let's move forward. I think we uh, have what we need. Oh, uh, my. Computer. Oh, okay. I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Horowitz. Mr. Walker. Mr. Hostel, do you have questions for Mr. Walker? Yes, I do. All right, go ahead and begin. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mr. Walker. My name is Ron Hofstel. I'm an attorney for the Franchise Tax Board. Just got a couple of questions for you and just some, get, to get some clarifications on, on dates and, and things like that, and then we'll and let you get back to the business. I, I, I appreciate you meeting with us in this morning at 930. I know it got a little complicated in yesterday and I appreciate your uh, making yourself available um, uh, for us in, in this morning. Um, sure. um, back in 2019, you prepared a declaration for Mr. Beckworth in, in, in this case, true? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what, what by declaration. What what do you mean? Did did you did you prepare a written statement um, at the request of Mr. Beckwith or one of his attorneys or representatives? I, I, I believe so. Yes. yes, that's my memory. Right. And 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 when was the last time you reviewed that document? 
not since I not since I wrote it. Um, on at paragraph um, six, you're trying to put things into context, and 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 one of the things you say in putting you know some kind of date context in all this is that um, um, his brother was uh, getting a divorce in 2012. 2012. And then you were kind of re relating all the events around around that divorce of 2012. And do you recall writing anything like, like that or saying anything about about that? No, I don't I don't recall what I wrote. Okay. Uh, Cuz you know the point I want to make is that is that by December 2011, Mr. Beckworth's brother was was already divorced. Um, and I was just asking if, if perhaps your recollection, you know, you, you went back seven or eight years then, you're going back in, in, in like 10 years now, whether or not, you know, the concept of year 2011, 2012, tw the, the, the 2013, I mean, is it crystal clear or is it somewhat fuzzy as to what years the, in these things may or may not have occurred? Uh, regarding when his brother's divorce was? No, and just regarding in the events we we just talked about things like the the um, the restaurant and looking at the the condominium and things like that. I mean, how how certain are you that these events happened in 2012 as opposed to as opposed to another year? In light of the fact that at least in your declaration you were off by. Mr. Beckwith's brother's divorce by a year. Objection, uh, well, most... uh, Your Honor, objection misstates um, the evidence. And if you look at exhibit um, two, which is pages 16 to 13, um, a verif agreed order permitting a verified amended complaint in the uh, lawsuit between Mr. Beckwith's brother and um, his former wife. It is stated that the divorce was on November 29th, 2019. So saying that he, he was divorced in 2012 is not necessary, is not a year off. I'm talking about Mr. Beckwith's brother. Larry Beck. I know, but I'm saying it's Larry Beckwith's divorce was on November 29th, 2012, uh, 2011. Exactly. And that is, and that is not, 2012 is not necessarily one year later. It could be only a few months later. Mr. Horowitz. I see what you're saying, but let Mr. Hopsell ask his question and then Mr. Walker can state what he knows. I'm going to, because Ray, can you pull up his declaration, please? So everybody can see what we're looking at. Just. have his declaration in the file we don't but you know it's just to refresh his memory and for possible impeachment of the day purposes and we're not going to have it admitted in as as the file but for purposes of refreshing his memory although i'm essentially going to have to read it to him um we're going to um you know present it for that limited purpose only yeah you can use it for the limited purpose but Again, let's not. No, 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 no. Ask I just, him if he remembers or not, then we'll move on from there. Yeah, I, okay. I, I agree 100%. So if you scroll down to paragraph six, and I know you can't do it, so I'll read it for you. And if I read it incorrectly, I'm sure that Mr. Horowitz and the will object. Um, excuse me, it's, yeah, paragraph six. It says, um, as a single man in the suburbs, David was bored. In 2012, his brother Larry was getting a divorce. 
Okay. Now I want to focus that on in 2012, his brother Larry was getting a divorce. And I want to ask you, since Larry was getting a divorce in 2011 and had that divorce finalized, finalized, as Mr. Horowitz said earlier, in November 2011, is it possible that your recollection of all the events around 2011 and 2012 are possibly off by a year because of the fact that, you know, our memories change and our memories fade? Uh, really, what the, all, I guess what the point I was making was his brother's divorce kind of started this chain of events of him him wanting to move from the suburbs and possibly looking at moving into the city. I got you. So, I don't know, you know, at the time I wrote that, I know, I mean, I, I still, you know, I don't know exactly when his brother's divorce officially settled. Okay. Um, at, you know, so I guess I was going for my best recollection, which I wasn't, you know, Right. Privy to the exact details, obviously, because I wasn't part right. of it. So, so, so we essentially agree that Larry Beck was divorce was kind of a driving force or the inertia to get these projects moving. True. Uh, Objection. When you say project, oh. Russell, can you clarify your question, please? Sure. Sure. If I understand what you're saying, and you can correct me, you're saying that one of the driving forces behind Mr. Beckwith wanting to move out of the suburbs and start this restaurant um, in the hip area of Nashville was his brother's divorce, true? Um, what I'm saying is his brother's divorce is what started him to selling his house in the suburbs. Okay, I got you. All right. Now, when you Google, and, 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 and you talked about that uh, a, a restaurant named Moto um, had uh, taken that space that you and Mr. Beckwith and were looking at? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that true? Yes. And the correct name of that restaurant is Moto Cucina and Enoteca, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, when you Google um, M Street and um, uh, uh, Mr. Caden, and you come across a, a newspaper article from the Nashville Business Journal, and that article is dated May 25th, May 25th, 2012, okay? And in that article, um, Mr. Caden and Chris Heinemann, and who, who's Chris Heinemann? Uh, he, he's the operating partner of Moto and M Street. Right, so in, in an article dated May 25th, 2012, they are talking about adding a Italian restaurant and a Mexican eatery uh, to their investment on McGavick Street. And I'm guessing McGavick Street means is, is part of the M Street partnership. Yeah. Right. So, you know, in light of that, and I can share this article with you to see if it refreshes it in your memory. In fact, maybe I should. You want to pull it up to Desiree? So in light of this article dated May 25th, 2012, where Mr. Haidman and Mr. Caden have indicated that they're going to make an investment in an Italian restaurant, the tentatively named um, um, Enoteca, um, uh, does that refresh your memory at all as to when you and Mr. Beckwith may have toured that property? No, it doesn't. Okay. I, mean, I, I don't. I don't know when. I, you know, as I said originally, I don't know when exactly we toured it. Other than it was, I remember being cold. 
Yeah, but but it, it could it could have also been in, in 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 you know cold as in January, February, March, and April when Mr. Uh, Beckwith was physically present in Tennessee. True. It, it it could I mean it could be other than, other than it being a cold month it could be yeah I don't I don't know I don't yeah. I don't know the day that we toured it. Right, but it could have been as early as January 2012. True. I don't know. I don't. Re I don't remember the date we toured it. Okay. All right. But I'm just saying. I know you don't remember the date. I'm just saying it could have been. It could have been the months of January, the months of February, the months of March. True. Uh, I, 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 I don't remember when we toured it. I, I really, I don't know. I mean, I guess it, it could be any time. Given I don't know when we toured it. Okay. Fair enough. Now, just looking at this article, I'll just read it for you and just to refresh in your memory a little bit here again. See if I can scroll it down a little bit. I haven't... I'm having a hard time scrolling it down, but it shows an article dated May 25th, 2012. And it talks, it says about three paragraphs down that M Street's investors say restauranteur Chris Heineman has a knack for being able to design and deliver a sexy, sophisticated dining experience that resonates with a certain type of urban professional. And they are betting he can continue executing as they begin working on launching two more ready restaurants in Italian, with the tentative with the name uh, Enoteca, and we know that's part of the Moto name, and a Mexican eatery uh, tentatively named Sant. Anejo. Was Santaneo ever developed? Yeah. Um, and an event hall on, on McGavick Street. Um, so, yeah. so, you know, based on that information, do you agree with me that you would have had to have toured that property with Mr. Beckwith prior to May 25th, 2012, the date of that article? I, I, re I really don't know when we toured it. I, I, I just I don't know. Okay. Fair enough. Now, you also said you had toured a, um, a, a unit, a condo at the Terrazzo. Is that? Yeah. You call that? Now, when you toured the Terrazzo property, did you do that before or after? Before or after? Um, uh, you toured the the possible site for the restaurant. I don't remember. Okay. And was it essentially in the same time frame? Uh, I I don't remember. I mean, the the only thing I really remember it was it was all around you know. It was all after David knew he was moving out of the suburbs. Okay. That. We went to look at the trials though. Okay. So it was and 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 it's your memory that he decided to move out of the suburbs coincided with Mr. Beckwith's brother's divorce, true? Yes, my memory was that the divorce was a catalyst to for him to move because he, yeah, the, the reason he was in that neighborhood was to be around Larry and his family and his children and that all that all kind of, you know, blew up a divorce. Yeah. So since the divorce was finalized in November 2011, and it was ongoing probably through, through, throughout the year, then you would agree with me that you possibly could have been looking at the Terrazzo unit and this restaurant anytime essentially in, in the end of 2011 as well. True? I, I, don't, re I don't remember when we looked at it. Okay. But it could have been 2011. That's what I'm just trying to get to. Objection, objection, he's already answered. That he doesn't know exactly when. He says he doesn't know exactly when. I'm just asking him, could you have looked at the Terrazzo property and the restaurant property in 2011? Answer, Mr. Walker. I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I don't mean to be difficult. I, I don't know. It's hard. I, 
I don't know when we looked at it, so it's hard for me to tell you a time frame okay. of when we looked at it, other than it was after the divorce. The really only thing I remember in relation to it all was that the divorce was, you know, that was the, the catalyst to start all this. And you may have testified to this, I don't recall. And, and Mr. Beckwith, at no time that you're aware of, ever made an offer on any property in Nashville other than the home he bought in 2008. Is that true? To my memory, I don't, I don't, I don't know of any offer to my, to my memory, but, you know. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about um, um, the chef in, in you had talked to. And you recall when Mr. Cherame, um, um came down to Nashville and you all sat around a table and discussed it in this possible plan? No, I don't remember the date. Okay. So it could have been in 2011 or 2012, true? It could, I, I, I don't remember, I, I have no, I don't know when the day was. Okay. I mean, it was, it was around the time we were talking about obviously doing our diligence on the concept, but I don't, I don't know the date. And, and what was your understanding of, of Mr. Cherimay's, uh, skill set, um, at the time you all were discussing this venture? Uh, it all kind of came through David that he was, he was a really good chef. And, um, and I think Dean was, it, from my recollection from dinner, Dean was kind of looking for a change, maybe to get out of New York. I believe he was living in New York city and, um, you know, the thought of moving to Nashville, I think, uh, excited him. And the con I think there was a concept maybe in New York that where he was, you know, that he thought was successful about the, the you know, other beer gardens. So, um, Basically, my, uh, David told me that Dean, he thought Dean would be a good chef for the concept. And when you sat around and, and, and was talking to Mr. Cherime, and, and did he discuss with, with you any of, any of his education and his work experience? Not that I remember. Um, did, uh, it's my understanding and then Mr. Cherime, um, got married to a, uh, a New York based fashion photographer, um, um, in 2011 or 2012, did the subject of his new, um, marriage could they come up at all in regards to moving to Nashville? I can't remember. Uh, I just don't remember. It's been a while, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I, but I do know, I mean, I, well, I do know part of it. I do. I do know part of this was. I do remember talking like, "Hey, you know, if we're going to do this, you got to move here, and you know, you got to move here, and be, you know, particularly early on, be willing to live here and be in the concept full time." So that was that was that was good. We wouldn't do that unless he was willing to move here. But as far as like, was he married then or not? I don't, I don't remember. And did he say he was willing to move? Uh, I can't remember, you know, the, the, the actual, like, uh, takeaway, but I mean, he was there. I mean, I think we were talking about it. We were talking about it. Are you, you know, we we're all trying to figure out, are we willing to make this commitment either financially or time wise? And I can't remember, you know, I don't know if I ever got a final answer or not. So, so, so as you recall, and you don't recall if Mr. Cherime would even commit to this project, true? Can you say that again? I said, at no time did Mr. Cherimay express to you his intent to commit to this project in Nashville. Is that true? Uh, 
Well, no, I mean, we, we never signed the lease, so there was no firm commitment. I mean, really what I remember is he was, you know, he, he had taken the time to come to Nashville and do his diligence. And we were all really trying to, you know, really quantify the magnitude of time. Um, in his example, it'd be time. And others would be money. And and I mean, what was your understanding as far as the financial uh, the commitment in this? And was Mr. Sheremay going to put up some money as well? Uh, I don't. We didn't really get that. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think we got that far as I mean, as into how much he would need to put up versus others. Um, okay. So his, you know, his, his was more around. Can you, can you put the commitment in to be the to run the culinary? I gotcha. And and for the most part, I mean, other than coming up with some, a couple of co concepts. I mean, you all didn't open up a bank account, true? Uh, correct. My, I don't remember. I, I don't. I don't think. To my knowledge, we didn't open up. You know, any business entity or bank account. To my knowledge, I, I did. did. I, nothing anybody? I was part of. And did you hire anybody and pay anybody a salary to do anything? Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. And you said that you were going to be a partner in this in this venture. Is that true? Yes, I was looking at uh, being a limited partner, making a financial commitment. Right now, you yeah. also said, and that, and that at the same time, and you were a partner with um, uh, M Street. True. Yes. Um, did your agreement with M Street allow you to open up a competing restaurant next door to their own ventures? I was a limited partner, um, but I, you know, so uh, I would have had to go back and check. I, I, I don't know. I would have found out. Um, my my thought was that likely not, but I would have had to firm that up before okay. cutting a check. I got you. So so. In other words, the part in the restaurant project hadn't gotten to, to the stage where you even made any inquiries to see whether or not you in, in you could participate in that venture. Is that true? Um, there was other partners. There was other limited partners in my M Street venture that were involved in other restaurants. Uh -huh. So my assumption was that it's highly unlikely as a limited partner that I would be restricted. Okay. So it wasn't a priority for me to do that. But no, I had not checked um, kind of the subscription documents that I signed that um, would that be an issue yet. I may be about finished. I'm just going through a couple more things here quick. I do have to ask on a side note, and when I was living in, in Nashville, I used to go to this little the chicken place called uh, Prince's Hot Chick Shack. Does that still exist? I believe so, yes. Yeah. And this will be just a couple more of the questions. What was your understanding at this time of Mr. Beckwith's um, um, skill set when it came to operating a restaurant? David's skill set? Yeah. Um, yeah, that he uh, would bring a lot of value to the build out of the concept, you know, designing the floor plan and the, and the art and, um, and it would add value on managing a restaurant, you know, basically um, the operations. So build out and operations. He's so, he's uh, creative. 
Yeah. So did he have any experience at all in front of a house or back of a house of a restaurant? Um, uh, I can't remember. So I, I don't know. That's all I have for you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Mr. Walker, Mr. Horwitz, did you have any other questions for Mr. Walker? Yes. Um, and I would request that, okay, Mr. Walker, in 2019, you prepared and signed a declaration on behalf of Mr. Beckwith, is that correct? Yes, I believe so. And at that time, was your recollection as to dates um, clearer than it is now, three years later? Uh, it's probably the same. I mean, it's been a long time in either, either example. And In your declaration at paragraphs eight and nine, you talk about um, David's interest in opening a beer garden style restaurant in the Gulch and inspecting a property that they were interested in um, that was owned by Jim Caden. And then in paragraph 10, you state that these events happened in the fall slash early winter of 2012. When you made that statement, would that would your recollection have been better than it was now? Um, possibly. I mean, uh, you would know, you only have, because it's you know it's been an extra two years, but or three or three years now, I guess. Um, would you have signed uh, yeah, the declaration? Time, uh, the declaration was the best of my memory at the time, and then obviously today is the best of my memory today. Okay, I have nothing further. Okay, thank you. Mr. Horowitz. Mr. Hostel, did you have any questions, that limited questions? Uh, no, thank you. Mr. Walker, before you go, I'm gonna see if my panel members have any questions for you. Judge Reidenauer, do you have any questions for Mr. Walker? <clears throat> Excuse me, this is Judge Reidenauer. I do not have any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Okay, Judge Lambert, do you have any questions for Mr. Walker? This is Judge Lambert. I don't have any questions at this time. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walker. I think we are finished with your testimony for today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Mr. Horowitz, did you have any other witnesses you plan oh. to call? Um, no, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Hostel, were you planning on calling any witnesses? Uh, no, I think I think we're we're ready to move to our our arguments section. Okay, Mr. Horowitz, are you ready to begin your legal argument for us? I will ask. Um, can we Judge take? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, you're talking over each other. Oh, I'm so, sorry, Mr. Hostel. Did you have a question? He was going to ask exactly what I was going to ask if we could take a short break for a couple minutes. <laughs> I think that's what Mr. Horowitz was going to ask. That's what I was going to ask. You read my mind, Ron. <laughs> uh, is five minutes work for both of you? Yes. Yeah. All right, we'll, okay, we'll break for five minutes. We'll return at 1030. Please do not exit the session. Just mute your audio and you can stop your video as well.
Okay, it is 1035. We are back on the record. Mr. Horowitz, are you ready for your legal argument? Mr. Horowitz, can you hear me? This is Judge Hosey. Yes, Your Honor. I've, I have, like I explained yesterday, I have split two screens and I have trouble moving the mouse from one screen to the other. So that is why I was somewhat delayed. No problem. Are you prepared for your uh, argument? Yes, I am, Your Honor. Okay, you have 30 minutes. Please begin. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Um, may it please the panel, um, Mr. Hofstell, Ms. Mikado, Mr. Beckwith, Mr. Barrent. The issue here today is, as set out in the conference minutes and order, is whether Mr. Beckwith was a resident of California on December 19, 2009, when his interest in Echo Energy Holding was so. The issue of whether someone is a resident of California is determined by the facts and circumstances of the individual case. Now, yesterday, Mr. Hofstell referenced the fact that this case in some ways is unusual. Normally, when you have a residency case involving someone who sells an asset and realizes a large amount of income from the sale, they are someone who was living in California who claims they moved out of state before the sale. In this case, Mr. Beckwith was domiciled in Tennessee, and the issue was whether he became a resident of California prior to the date of the sale on December 19th. The, a person under California law, section 17014A of the um, Revenue and Taxation Code states that a resident includes anyone who is domiciled, every individual who's in this in California for other than a temporary or transitory purpose, and every individual who is domiciled in California who is outside the state for a temporary or transitory purpose. And further, that an individual who is a resident of this state continues to be a resident even though temporarily absent from California. A non-resident under 17015 is anyone who is not a resident of California. California taxes residents on all of their taxable income, um, regardless of the source or where it is derived from what jurisdiction it is derived from. Non-residents are only taxable on that is sourced to California. Now then, this case, a domicile is the place where an indiv individual has his true, fixed, permanent home and principal establishment and to which place he has, whenever he is absent, the intention of returning. Now, the evidence in this case, much of it is undisputed. Mr. Beckwith was an officer of president of operations and a director of Echo Energy Holdings. In 2011, he and his brother discussed and explored putting Echo Energy Holdings on the market, but were told by Wells Fargo Bank that the company was not sellable. In April, they engaged Piper Jaffrey and Mr. Beckwith and his brother resigned their positions as officers of the company, but remained as directors overseeing the company's operations. And two individuals, um, Chad Martin was made chief executive officer and Gwen Tan was made 
chief operating officer and chief financial officer of the company. And the attempts to locate a buyer commenced and ultimately um, a, an, an agreement was reached with Coper Sucre N.A. Now in February of, now Mr. Beckwith in the spring, late fall, winter, early spring of 2012, began dating a young woman who lived in Los Angeles, Lauren Frey, and beginning in April, mid-April, he began seeing, visiting Miss Frey in Los Angeles and spending a substantial amount of time visiting her in California. Um, on April, in the week of April 16th, he entered into an agreement to acquire property on West 5th Street in Los Angeles in a short sale. That deal closed in July 2012. Mr. Beckwith retained contractors to a contractor, Highcrest Contracting, to um, begin remodeling and, re and renovating the property. And that began at the end of July, July 30th, 2012, and it was estimated to be completed by the end of in five months, which would have been the end of December 2012, Mr. Beckwith testified that the work done was not completed until sometime in January. Um, and I believe he said that glass doors on a pool house were installed at that, that time, which completed the work. Besides um, High Crest, he also um, engaged other contractors, Serta Pro Painters, and Nana Walls to assist in re renovation and remodeling of the property. Now, although Mr. Beckwith was in California substantial periods of time during the summer and fall of 2012, each time he was in California, it was for the temporary and transitory purpose of courting Miss Frey. And due to um, his 18% approximately ownership interest in Echo Energy and his um, involvement in the company. He could not leave Tennessee until, in fact, Echo Energy was sold and the deal to sell the property, the company closed. Now, Mr. Beckwith, in Mar approximately March 2012, put his home that he owned in Franklin, Tennessee at 1089 Vaughn Crest Drive on the market for sale. And he said the impetus of this was the fact that his brother Larry had divorced and that the reason he had bought the home was that it was close to his brother Larry and it was far bigger than he as a single man needed. It was approximately 9,200 square feet on a one acre lot. So he began putting it on the sale and began looking for a new place to buy in the Gulch district of Nashville, a condominium. And this was, and shortly after this is approximately the time, about a month or so after this is when he started see, coming to California regularly to visit with Ms. Fry. Also, um, it took a long time initially, Mr. Beckwith ultimately sold the property in the end of October 2012. And he, because of the market conditions, the amount he got the sale price was what he had purchased the property for four and a half years earlier. So the market was not very good at that time in Franklin, and he took the best offer he got. At that point, when he, prior to um, the sale closing, he vacated the premises because he had engaged Michael Taylor moving estate, uh, estate and moving sales company to um, take the property, his furnishings out of the home on Vaughn Street and ultimately to put it up for consignment. And that sale occurred in December, uh, 
where the sales began in December of 2012. Melvin, at the time, he moved out of the home in, out of his home in Nashville. Mr. Beckwith did not intend to stop being a resident of Tennessee. He kept his cars registered in Tennessee. His driver's license remained in Tennessee. And he changed the address on his driver's license from the to his mother's address, which is what he considered to be his residence. After he left, vacated the Vaughn Street property, and that is pages 923 and 924 of the exhibit binder. It is the State of Tennessee Department of Safety and Home Security driver's license, which shows the address on page 924 from Mr. Beckwith is shown as on the King Street Circle address where he, which he considered his residence. Um, now then besides changing the address on his driver's license to the King Street address, he had his mail forwarded to the King Street address. He also had his statements for his principal bank accounts at Bank of America and his credit cards with Citibank and American Express changed to the King Street address and the pages of from the exhibit binder showing the addresses to which the Bank of America accounts 6454 were sent are pages 929, 931, 933, 935, 937, 939, 941, 943, and 946, um, and 947. And those show that the statements for periods ending honored before October 17th were sent to the Vaughncrest address, and those for periods at ending statements for periods ending after that were sent to the King Arthur address. Bank of America statements for account ending in 442. Um, those were the only statements in the record are those issued after October 17th, 2012. And those are at pages 951 and 953. And they show the King Arthur address. His main Bank of America account um, was account 2045-2046, and statements showing his address are at binder pages 955, 958, 961, 964, 967, 971, 978, 984, 991, 997, 1003, 1009, and 1014, the statements for periods ending on or before October 17th, 2012, show the Vaughn Crest address, the statements for the periods ending prior to January 3rd, 2013, show the King Arthur address, and the statements for the ending after, on or after January 3rd, show the West Fifth Street address. Similarly, the Amex cards and the MasterCard show that prior to statements for periods ending prior to October 17th were um, sent to the Vaughn Street address for statements ending between after October 17th, but before January 3rd, 2013, were sent to the King Arthur address and statements for the West Fifth Street property after January 3rd, 2013, were sent to the West Fifth Street, I mean, West Fifth Street address in Los Angeles. And I may have misspoke. Statements for October 17th, 2012 through January 3rd, 
2013 were sent to the King Arthur address. And if the panel wants, I can refer them to the exhibit binder page numbers. Your Honor, would you want me to give the page numbers? No, Mr. Horowitz, that's okay. We have them. Thank you. Okay. Um, now then, Mr. Beckwith, besides having his driver's license changed to the King Arthur address, having his mail forwarded to that address, and having his statements for his bank accounts and his credit cards sent to that address, um, still considered himself and remained and intended to stay in Tennessee. And this was because if the sale did not go through, that he would have to remain, the sale of Echo Energy, he would have to remain in Tennessee. And as he stated, his brother told him that if the, if the sale didn't come through, he had, would have required David to remain in Tennessee. Now then, um, there were, we discussed yesterday through Mr. Kuhn, um, the provisions of the agreement between Kofor Sucre and Echo Energy, the membership interest um, purchase agreement. And it, it, Article 10 states that there are various conditions and um, warranties that each party was obligated to fulfill for the property for the deal to close. Um, the, this due diligence process continued through the time that the deal closed. Now, Mr. Kuhn said that he, when I had asked him if the deal required any approval by a government entity, I believe he, he responded in the negative to his knowledge. But if you look at it, page 2847 of the exhibit binder, which is the Echo Energy um, actions by the board effective as of November 1, 2012, on page 2848. It states that in the middle of the page, it states that in connection with the sale and under the Hart Scott Rodino Act, um, the corporation, which is Echo Energy, is required to file a notification and report form for certain mergers and acquisitions with each of the Federal Trade Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice. And it also states that the board would file a a form a um, a report with the Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States concerning the sale. And this was to get approved to ensure that the sales would not result in the, to get approval by the government of the sales. And these were things that were outside of the control of Echo Energy and Coper Sucre. Now, Mr. Khan stated and testified that you know, basically both parties wanted the deal to go through and did what they could to ensure that the deal would go through. And in, in all cases, um, we can assume that when parties enter into a transaction like this, that they anticipate and desire for the deal to go through and will act in good faith and will try to act in a way to make the deal go through, but not all deals go through. Oftentimes, even major deals end up not being consummated. Um, and Mr. Khan testified that there were an about adverse event, materially adverse effects, which could result in the deal being Washed, and that was in Article 10 of the agreement. And 10C, absence of changes, states that since the date of the latest balance sheet, no material adverse effects shall have occurred. And 
G states that there have been, must not have been any material adverse effect since the effective date, which would have been November between November 1 and the date the deal was closed. There could be no material adverse effects. And Mr. Khan stated that if there had been a fire at the um, terminal, the gas terminal or the ethanol terminal, or was it that Echo Energy owned, that this would have a material adverse effect. And those types of fires do occur and they are unpredictable. And so if a fire occurred shortly before it was closed, it could have had a materially adverse effect and Koper Sucre could have withdrawn from the contract. There are other adverse effects that could have resulted in Koper Sucre withdrawing from the, con from the contract. One would be Mr. Khan testified about the Alliance plants, which were the manufacturers of ethanol, which was the product that Echo Energy sold to major to oil companies. If there had been a fire or a flood at their facilities, a major fire or flood, which destroyed their facilities, that would have reduced the amount of eth ethanol that Echo Energy could have purchased and that would have been a material adverse effect. Similarly, if one of the Alliance plants and had financial reverses or ended up being forced into bankruptcy or receivership prior to the closing, that could have been a material adverse effect, which would have caused Koper Sucre to either postpone closing or to cancel the agreement. Similarly, Mr. Hofstadt yesterday questioned Mr. Um, Khan about the fact that Echo Energy, when we were discussing the material changes to the latest balance sheet, the fact that Echo Energy um, sold much of its product under contracts that were entered into one to three months before delivery and, and possibly up to six months before delivery. And Mr. Khan testified that to his recollection, approximately 10% approximately 90% of the contracts were for the one to three and occasionally six month term and the rest would have been spot contracts. And we all are aware from the recent events that have occurred in Ukraine and the effect of those events, prices of, of gas, oil and other hydrocarbon products can spike up or possibly down. And these are material adverse effects that could affect the balance sheet. Similarly, contracts require both parties not only being willing to perform, but being able to perform. And while if Echo Energy had the product, it would obviously ship the product to its customer. Um, if a major customer went into bankruptcy or receivership, or had severe financial reversals, it may be unable to perform under the contract and to take delivery of the ethanol. And this would be a materially adverse effect. And we all, I believe, uh, at least I am old enough to remember the collapse of Enron Energy, which up until the summer of 2001, just before it collapsed, was considered, was one of the major corporations in the United States held up as an icon and it collapsed and was unable to fill, uh, fulfill its contracts. It went into bankruptcy and ended up with the prosecution of two of the principals of the company. So there were many, many materially adverse events that could occur if that could have affected the deal over which neither Koper Sucre nor Echo Energy had any control. And these event and the possibility of adverse events, including as because COPE, it was a cross-border deal in which an American company was being purchased by a Brazilian company, these were things that made closing uncertain until the deal actually closed. Like they say, it ain't over till it's over, or it ain't over till the fat lady sings, or until the deal actually closed and the money hit the banks, it was not a certainty that the deal 
would close. And because it wasn't a certainty, um, the Mr. Beckwith had not still intended to remain a resident of Tennessee and that his visits to California would be only temporary to visit with Ms. Frey and then return to Tennessee. And if the deal had fallen through, he would not have been able to, he would have had to have stayed in Tennessee and remained a resident of Tennessee. Now then, what happened after the deal closed? Um, Mr. Beckwith, the deal closed on December 19th, on December, based on the calendar, page 2767 of the exhibit binder, the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st of December, Mr. Beckwith was in Tennessee. He then was in California the 22nd, 23rd, and part of the 24th, as he testified to pick up Ms. Fry. And then from the 25th till January 3rd, he was out of California, initially in Las Vegas, and then in on vacation. And so if you look at when he went to Tennessee, he did not return to California. He was in Tennessee with the intention of, reside, of remaining there if the deal fell through, pro, did not go through and did not actually close. And that it went it act. And so he was not a resident of, ten, of California at that time. He was still a resident of Tennessee. And interestingly, he was in Tennessee from that period to the end of December, he was in Tennessee four days, two and a half in California, and the remainder of the month, I believe approximately nine days outside of California and outside of Tennessee. Um, what happened after Mr. Beckwith came back, came to California from vacation on January 3rd? Shortly after that, he had his vehicles registered in California. He had his Prius, he, had, he traded, he turned in, had the Jaguar turned into the dealership. He got a driver's license in California. He executed, he um, registered to vote in California. He also began investing in real property in California. He purchased several pieces of investment property in California. Also, he began looking for a place to become a restaurant. And although Mr. Hofstell asked him whether it was soon after he moved to Cal, after January 3rd that he found the restaurant property. In fact, as Mr. Beckwith testified, it wasn't until the end of April that he began leasing a property. And although there, Mr. Beckwith was shown a check to a Mr. Silvestra, showing that, um, which showed a payment for of a thousand dollars for a menu. He had also gotten a menu for the from Mr. Charmay for the potential concept of a beer garden that never came to fruition. So just getting someone doing a menu does not mean that the concept of the restaurant would close, but it does show that it was not soon after, it was several months, three or four months after he came to California and established residency here that Mr. Beckwith began leasing the property that was became a restaurant and that opened as a restaurant, the Stamp Gourmet, I believe, in early 2014. Now then, the two case min law- Two minutes, Mr. Horowitz. How much? You have two minutes. Two? Yes, two. Or 10. Two, two? as in one, two. Oh my yes. God. Okay, okay, Your Honor. I'll be quick. In Clemp, the court dealt with a person who was who had originally who was domiciled in Illinois. They had originally had homes in Illinois. They had an apartment that they leased in Illinois. They built a place in Rancho Mirage, California. They stopped leasing property in Illinois. They would stay in an apartment hotel when they were in California. And the FT, I mean, when they were in Illinois and they spent most of the year, more day, substantially more days in California than Illinois in the period in issue. 
in holding that they were not residents of California. The court noted that they, you know, the fact that they did not have a, a fixed and permanent place of abode did not mean that they were no longer, that they were, had become residents of California, that their business interests were in, in Illinois, like Mr. Beckwith's business interest was with Echo Energy in Tennessee, that he had, they had driver's license from Illinois, that they had their cars registered in Illinois, and that they had other contacts in Illinois, which meant that they were still domiciled and residents of, of Illinois. Similarly, the Corbett case, the court held that the, even though the taxpayers were in California more at their home in California more than their home in Illinois, that they remained residents of Illinois and, and were never residents of California. And I believe, are my two minutes up? Yes, but you'll have an opportunity for another closing statement um, after Mr. Hostel's presentation and then um, time for questions. So you'll have another 15 minutes in a little bit. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Mr. Hostel or Ms. Macedo, whoever is planning on presenting, you may begin when ready. Good morning, may it please the panel. My name is Desiree Macedo. I will be presenting on behalf of the Franchise Tax Board. The purpose behind California's personal income taxation of residents is to ensure that individuals who are physically present in the state enjoying the benefits and protections of its laws and government contribute to its support regardless of the source of the taxpayer's income. As pointed out in Bragg and many other cases, this purpose underlies all residency decisions. Further, analyzing the taxpayer's connections within and without California is ultimately designed to determine not only what benefits and protections the taxpayer received from California, but whether the benefits and protections are consistent with California residency. California's residency analysis starts with the statute. Under California Revenue and Taxation Code, Section 17014A, a California resident includes, one, every individual who is in this state for other than a temporary or transitory purpose. And two, every individual domiciled in this state who is outside the state for a temporary or transitory purpose. Thus, the determination of appellant's residency is essentially a two-part test that starts with determining appellant's domicile and concludes with weighing factors to determine whether appellant was either inside California for other than a temporary or transitory purpose, or whether appellant was outside California for a temporary or transitory purpose. If it is determined that appellant was domiciled outside of California, he could only be deemed a California resident under A1. However, if it is determined that appellant was domiciled in California, he could be deemed a California resident under both A1 and A2. In the present case, it is clear. Appellant had was a California resident under both A1 and A2 as of November 1st, 2012. Therefore, pursuant to 17014C, appellant when temporarily absent from California would continue to be, be a California resident. I will first discuss the domicile analysis. As defined in Whittle v. Franchise Tax Board, domicile is a place in which a person has the most settled and permanent connections and the place to which an individual intends to return to whenever absent. In other words, in determining whether appellant changed his domicile, two things are indispensable. First, residence in the new locality, and second, the intention to remain there. Furthermore, as pointed out in Mazur, appellant's own actions must support a change of domicile. Unsubstantiated statements will not suffice. Moreover, as stated in the non-presidential decision of the appeal of Grant, little evidentiary weight should be given to testimony given by friends and family. In the present case, appellant's actions reflect he was a California domiciliary before the sale of Eco Energy Holdings. The most significant of these actions include the fact that he was continuously present in California during which time he courted his fiance, the fact that he purchased a California abode on July 11th, 2012, 
as well as the subsequent cosmetic improvements and maintenance of this California abode. The fact that he shipped a 2011 Toyota Prius to his California abode on August 7, 2012. The fact that he went engagement ring shopping with Miss Frey on October 29, 2012, and reproposed with her family in attendance soon thereafter. The fact that he continuously owned and maintained his California rental property and the fact that he continuously provided financial and emotional support to his ex-wife, his stepdaughter, and later his fiance. These actions combined with the fact that appellant sold his Tennessee abode, he sold his Tennessee per personal property to a consignment shop, and he returned his firearm to a Tennessee gun shop by October 31st, 2012, demonstrates a clear intent to remain permanently and indefinitely in California, and thus become a California domiciliary by at least November 1st, 2012. Furthermore, appellant's physical presence in California was consistent with that of a California domiciliary. The days appellant was physically present in California during the period at issue far exceeded the amount of days appellant was in Tennessee. On the other hand, appellant's stay in Tennessee for a four-day period, including two travel days, in which appellant stayed with family, or his, as he testified yesterday, his brother specifically, reflects at best nothing more than a transient presence. Moreover, the calendar reflects that when appellant was on vacation, he left from and returned to his home in California. As such, appellant's physical presence in California during the period at issue more aptly reflects the physical presence contemplated by Wattel, Mazer and Bracamonte. Again, the question for the sake of argument is not whether appellant became a California domiciliary, but when. It is undisputed that appellant was domiciled in California starting no later than January 3rd, 2013, some 15 days after the sale of Eco Energy Holdings. But if appellant did in fact change his domicile to Tennessee in 2008, appellant's actions including his physical presence in California, clearly reflects that appellant was domiciled in California some two months earlier and no later than November 1st, 2012. As stated in Mazur, the analysis then shifts to whether appellant was either inside California for other than a temporary or transitory purpose or outside of California for a temporary or transitory purpose. The key question under either A1 or A2 is whether appellant's purpose in either entering or leaving California is temporary or transitory in nature. The, pre the regulation provides guidance in this regard. The connections that a taxpayer maintains with the state when compared with other states are important indications of whether a person's entrance to or absence from California is temporary or transitory. Such connections are an objective indication of whether the benefits and protections that the taxpayer has received from the state of California are consistent with other non-transitory inhabitants. Some 19 years ago, the Board of Equalization decided Bragg. As part of its analysis, the board listed approximately 19 factors that were helpful to the board in evaluating a taxpayer's connections in prior cases. In fact, very few of the connections identified in Bragg are actually discussed in Bragg. That being said, the factors are non-exhaustive and serve merely as a guide. The weight given to any particular factor depends upon the totality of the circumstances. However, as stated in Bracamonte, the physical presence factor is given greater significance than mental intent and the formalities that tie one to a particular state. Further, as stated in the appeal of Tyrus Cobb, a mere formalism, such as a change in registration or a statement that appellant intended to be a resident of another state does not ordinarily settle the issue. The Bragg factors were recently separated into three categories by the Office of Tax Appeals. First, physical presence and property. Second, personal and professional associations, which generally describe one's habits of life. And third, registration and filings with the state or other agency which generally reflects the mere formalisms described in Cobb. Here, the connections appellant acquired in California, severed in Tennessee, 
and maintained in both states reflect that appellant did in fact receive benefits and protections in accord with other California residents. I will now discuss the 12 most relevant factors in this case in accordance with the Mazur groupings. The first category I will discuss is the physical presence and property category. I will first discuss the physical presence factor. As stated in Bracamonte, appellant's physical presence is given significant weight when analyzing the formalities that tie appellant to one particular state. When you color code the physical presence calendar, the calendar is striking. The red reflects the days of appellant admits to being physically present in California. The blue reflects the days appellant admits to being physically present in Tennessee. And the yellow reflects days appellant admits to being physically present in another location. Appellant increased his physical presence in California from an average of four days a month to 12 days starting in April of 2012. This is about the time he started his relationship with Ms. Frey. Appellant terminated his employment with Eco Energy and after Cooper Sukar and Eco Energy Holdings entered into a confidentiality agreement. Then in May of 2012, appellant's physical presence in California dramatically increased. This coincided with the fact that appellant not only started paying Ms. Frey's medical premiums for the year, but assumed responsibility for paying all of the rent associated with Grace Avenue. Appellant was physically present in California for 24 days in May, 23 days in June, 27 days in July, 23 days in August, 19 days in September, and 16 days in October. Conversely, appellant was physically present in Tennessee for six days in May, six days in June, four days in July, eight days in August, seven days in September, and 10 days in October. Significantly starting in May 2012, appellant's continuous presence in California could be measured in weeks, while his continuous presence in Tennessee could be measured in days. In fact, the longest day in Tennessee was for a 10-day period from October 9th, 2012, through October 18th, 2012, presumably to arrange for the consignment sale and prepare for the Tennessee abode for sale. Then in November, appellant was physically present in California for 17 days, Tennessee for no, zero days, and elsewhere for 13. In December, appellant was physically present in California for 13 days, Tennessee for four days, and elsewhere for 14. When you look at appellant's physical presence prior to November 1st and after December 19th, the fact that he took a vacation in November and December is mostly unremarkable because by November 1st, 2012, he was already well settled in his new California abode. The chart reflects significant consecutive presence in California starting as early as April of 2012. On the other hand, the, the chart reflects a reduction of presence in Tennessee throughout the entire 2012 taxable year. Moreover, appellant's four-day trip to Tennessee during the period of December 18, 2012 through December 21, 2012 was for the sole purpose of completing the sale. Thus, this factor clearly favors California residency. The second factor I will discuss is the home factor. On July 11, 2012, Appellant purchased West Fifth Street in Los Angeles, thus acquiring a significant connection to California. Further, prior to November 1st, 2012, Appellant had completed cosmetic renovations to his new home, which included updating the bathrooms and the kitchen. Then on October 31st, 2012, Appellant severed a significant connection to Tennessee when he sold his Tennessee abode. As of November 1st, 2012, Appellant's only permanent abode was located in California, an abode to which his fiance had moved into after vacating Grace Avenue on or about September 1st, 2012. As such, this factor also favors California residency. I will now move on to the personal and professional associations category. The third factor I will discuss is a familial relationship factor. The string of familial abode cases, including the appeal of Charles P. Vaughn, the appeal of W.J. Sasser, and Mazur, is clear that when, appellant, that when family members are dependent on a taxpayer for both their financial support and their well-being, then the taxpayer receives the benefit and protections of knowing that his or her familial abode were protected by the laws and government of the state. 
a factor which the Board of Equalization and most recently the Office of Tax Appeals has found persuasive of California residency. During the 2012 taxable year, appellant continued to maintain significant relationships in both Tennessee and California. Members of appellant's extended family, including his mother and brother, lived in Tennessee. However, it does not appear that appellant provided any financial support to these members. On the other hand, appellant continued to support Ms. Frey and Ms. Machado, who resided in California during the period at issue. Not only did appellant financially support Ms. Frey by paying her rent, her medical expenses, and other personal expenses, by September 1st, 2012, appellant shared a California familial abode with Ms. Frey. And by October 29th, 2012, appellant intended to marry Ms. Frey evidenced by the fact that he went engagement ring shopping with Ms. Frey on October 29th. As such, this factor also favors California residency. The fourth factor I will discuss is the employment factor. From 1997 until 2008, appellant served as sales representative for Eco Energy Holdings while living in California. On or about May 16th, 2008, appellant joined his brother in Tennessee um, as president of operations. According to appellant's testimony yesterday, appellant terminated his employment with Eco Energy Holdings and was replaced in April of 2012, although he alleges he remained on the board. Moreover, appellant concedes that he performed these services in California when he was physically present in California. Thus, this, this factor also favors California residency. The fifth factor I will discuss is the rental property factor. During the 2012 taxable year, appellant continued to maintain and rent out his previous California abode. As such, this factor also favors California residency. The sixth factor I will discuss is the religious affiliation factor. Appellant in indicated that he attended Cross Point Church in Tennessee during the 2012 taxable year. Cross Point Church only holds services on Sundays, and during the period at issue, appellant was not physically present in Tennessee on a Sunday. As such, it appears appellant had severed his connection with Cross Point Church prior to November 1st, 2012. On the other hand, appellant was physically present in California on six Sundays from October 28th, 2012 to December 23rd, 2012. Thus, if appellant was inclined to attend church services, those services would have taken place in California. As such, this factor either slightly favors California residency or remains neutral in determining California residency. The seventh factor I will discuss is the membership factor. Appellant claims to have been a member of the Citizens Club of Nashville, Tennessee. However, appellant was only present in Tennessee for four days after November 1st, 2012. As such, it appears appellant would not have had a significant presence at the club during the period at issue. Therefore, this factor remains neutral in determining California residency. The eighth factor I will discuss is the professional service factor. After November 1, 2012, appellant maintained professional services in both Tennessee and California. Thus, this factor remained neutral in determining California residency. The ninth factor I will discuss is the business interest factor. Although appellant continued to maintain his associations with some of his businesses located in Tennessee during the 2012 taxable year, Appellant claims he was not required to be physically present in Tennessee to perform his duties, which is consistent with his minimal presence in Tennessee during the period at issue. Thus, this factor also remains neutral in determining California residency. Lastly, I will discuss the registration and filings category. The 10th factor I will discuss is the gun, factor, that gun license factor. Appellant claims he held a Tennessee handgun permit during the 2012 tax full year. Although appellant was unable to locate the license, he provided a receipt from a gun shop in Tennessee indicating that he sold a weapon to them on October 17th, 2012. The fact that appellant held a Tennessee gun license for the 2012 taxable year is mostly irrelevant since he no longer owned the weapon triggering the need for the license. However, it is relevant that he sold his weapon on October 17th, 2012, which is consistent with respondents findings that appellant severed his ties with Tennessee on November 1st, 2012. Hence, this factor also favors California residency. The 11th factor I will discuss is the vehicle registration factor. On August 7th, 2012, 
appellant shipped his Prius to his West Fifth Street abode, which was registered in California on January 18, 2013. Although appellant did not take the necessary administrative steps to register his vehicle in California, as of August 7, 2012, appellant received benefits and protections of California by having a reliable method of transportation available to him when he was physically present in California. Although this factor should be given little weight, it slightly favors California residency. The last factor I will discuss is the driver's license factor. On January 18th, 2012, or 2013, two months after respondent determined appellant to be a California resident, appellant also obtained a California driver's license. When appellant moved to Tennessee on or about May 16th, 2008, it took him two months to comply with Tennessee law regarding driver's license and registering vehicles. Therefore, it's not extraordinary that appellant move, followed the same loose guidelines when he moved to California. Therefore, this factor is neutral in determining California residency. When viewed in its to totality, it's clear. Regardless of his domicile, appellant was a California resident under either prong as of November 1st, 2012, if not earlier. As stated in this briefing, this case is quite different from Klemp for a, my from Klemp from a myriad of reasons. Um, we have distinguished Klemp um, from this case in about 15 different ways. Um, for brevity, I will discuss the top five ways that this case is different from Klemp, but would be welcome to answer any questions the panel may have. Here it is a question of timing. Whether Mr. Beckwith was a California resident on December 19th, 2012, the date he sold Eco Energy, or several weeks later, and specifically on January 3rd, 2013, as he claims, the issue in Klemp was not about timing. Rather, whether Illinois domiciliaries were, or over the course of six more years, merely so seasonal visitors to California. The only connection that the Klemps maintained with California was a desire to spend the winter months in California in a home to serve that purpose. While Beckwith, while Pellant owned a rental property and a familial abode where he and his fiance lived permanently, Appellant also supported his stepdaughter, a California resident. Third, in Clemped over the tax year, the taxpayer spent as much, if not more, of each year physically present in another place than, Cal than California. Here, since April of 2012, Appellant specific spent specifically, significantly more time in California than anywhere else. Fourth, in Klemp, all parties agreed that they remain domiciled in Illinois. In this case, domicile is not only disputed, but appellant's actions both before, during, and after the time at issue reflects an intention to make California his permanent home. In five, before leaving California to work for Eco Energy in Tennessee, appellant had a long history in California, which included being both a domiciliary and a resident. And during the time at issue, Appellant maintained many of these connections. Um, and when Appellant substantially re-entered California some four years after, at least by November 1st, 2012, he remained a Cal... Then Appellant substantially re-entered California some four years later. And he remained a California resident through at least 2012, if not beyond. Seasons are not measured by decades, in fact, Appellant was physically present in California during all four of the seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter of 2012. Moreover, if the facts of this case were reversed and the issue was whether appellant moved out of California on December 19th, 2012, then the facts of this case would be similar to the non-presidential decision and the appeal of ACON. In Con, appellant was found to be a California non-resident because he had severed all significant connections to California and only retained connections under the registration and filing category in the state, which is given less weight than the connections under the other two categories. Similarly, appellant in the present case not only retained connections under the registration and filing category in Tennessee after November 1st, 2012, Although Khan was not a presidential decision, Khan reiterates that connections under the registration and filing category alone are insufficient connections to prove residency. To conclude, appellant was a California resident 
when he redeemed 234,000 shares of Eco Energy Holdings prior to the sale on December 19th, 2012. Appellant obtained significant connections, including an overwhelming physical presence in California. Further, by December 19th, 2012, appellant had severed all significant connections to Tennessee. Appellant was clearly receiving benefits and protections of California, and thus is subject to the personal income tax to the California personal income tax on all income earned during the relevant time period. Thank you. I can answer any questions the panel has at this time. Start with Judge Reidenauer. Do you have any questions for the parties? Hello, this is Judge Reidenauer. Um, actually, I do. So um, these questions will be for Mr. Beckwith, if you don't mind. Um, so it's been indicated that you were told to stay in Tennessee if the sale of the company did not go through. Is this correct? That is correct. And do you have any documentation substantiating that? You know, my brother was willing to sign an affidavit, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Horwitz said it was too late to um, to submit that. And um, yesterday, I saw that you know the the defense uh, did submit more more uh, documentation. So I guess I could have done that, but I I was told that it was too late to do that. But my brother was willing to sign an affidavit. Um, so my other question was, um, why would your presence be necessary if it does appear that your presence was not in Tennessee since mid-April and this company had not been sold yet? If the company did not sell, then we would have to come up with a new plan. We'd have to come up with a new person to, you know, uh, sell the company. And we didn't know, you know, if we were going to continue running the company or sell it or, you know. We probably were going to resell it, but he said my presence was definitely necessary. And when and about I, the uh, board of directors as well? I'm, I apologize for interrupting. That's okay. Um, and when were you notified that your presence would be necessary if the sale did not go through? Um, that was I recently talked to my brother about that. So, you know, but I bet it was an it was an assumption that I would, you know is going to have to maintain being in, in a resident of Tennessee if the company did not sell. So um, this assumption in mind, what was the reasoning for purchasing the West Fifth Street in California? The reason for purchasing was for a place to stay when I was in town and I didn't want to stay, as I said in my testimony, I didn't want to uh, stay at Lauren's apartment and I was pursuing a relationship with her and a place for her, but the main reason was investment and a, a good investment and a place to stay when I came to visit. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, did you and Ms. Frey talk about where your living arrangements would be as a couple? She was under, she, she was very well aware that I could spend limited time in California. She was aware of that and yeah, and that's that's it. But, but you know, as as far as I'm not sure what the question is. Um, I guess my question would be that it appears that you may have been staying in Tennessee, yet she was living in California for the duration of your engagement and courtship. And if there was any discussion about her possibly moving to Tennessee and what she felt about that. No, no discussion about her moving to Tennessee. There were, we didn't have the discussion because the biz, until the business was until the business was known whether it was going to sell or not, that discussion didn't have to come up because the business did sell. Okay, let me look over my notes real quick, please. Um, during this courtship between before the engagement, was there a reason why it appears Ms. Frey, the majority of the courtship was done in California as opposed to Tennessee? Uh, no particular reason. Uh, she was she was a wor working actress, so she was tied here for her, her career and so forth. 
I believe that would be the main main reason. Um, those are all my questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Beckwith. Judge Lambert, do you have any questions for the parties? Hi, this is Judge Lambert. Um, yeah, I just had one question for FTD that um, if we're focusing on the deal, if the deal like hypothetically didn't go through and uh, Mr. Beckwith, you know, you know, uh, didn't move to California, would FTV still argue that he became a resident of California at the same time in November? Because I see that FTV was arguing that he had a house in California and sold his national home in November. So if the deal had not gone, gone through actually as their state, uh, what would FTV uh, say about his residency change? Yes, um, you can be a resident of more than one state and by November 1st, 2012, um, appellant had severed all of those connections with Tennessee. Um, even if the business, I mean, it's a very big hypothetical, the facts do not show it. Um, he had retained benefits and protections of the state of California such that he would be a resident. So the question is not whether or not he would have been a resident of Tennessee. The question is whether he would have been a resident of California. And by um, November 1st, 2012, he had retained the benefits and protections of that of a California resident. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. To Sato and Judge Lambert, um, this is Judge Hosey. I have a question for Ms. Macedo too, or the Franchise Tax Board. Um, my understanding, or maybe I need some clarification, is that the burden of proof um, is on the party asserting a change in domicile. Is that right? Yes, the, um, the burden of proof um, changes for domicile. However, for residency, the burden of proof reverts back to the taxpayer. So it just depends on who, for domicile, who's asserting the change. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I, I needed the clarification on that. Okay, that was my only question. Um, Mr. Horowitz, did you have a closing statement you wanted to make? Yes, very briefly, Your Honor. Go ahead. Um, first, a couple of points. Um, Ms. Masato, Mikado said that Mr. Beckwith was supporting his former wife and his stepdaughter who were in California. Mr. Beckwith was paying spousal support to his wife pursuant to the dissolution of their marriage and under the decree. And that would not be in my mind sufficient to make someone a resident of California that they are paying spousal support to someone living in California. And there were, and I would like to refer to page 1063 of the exhibit binder, which is a check Mr. Um, Beckwith wrote to Ms. Machado in February 2012, showing that it's the 6th of 10th payments. He was obligated to make 10 payments to Ms. Machado. And that would not just because he was paying his former spouse support or settlement pursuant to a settlement agreement does not make him a resident. Second, she stated that he was supporting Kaylee Machado. Um, page 110, 109 of the exhibit binder shows the total amount that Mr. Um, Beckwith paid toward, to help Kaylee Machado. He gave her $6,000, four months rent, plus $1,000 towards her wedding, $200, and then it, he gave her $2,000 as a Christmas gift. And these don't constitute, in my mind, actively supporting someone. Um, and the amounts given to her were relatively minimal. Third, as Your Honor pointed out, under Mazur and other cases, the burden of proving um, don't, a change of domicile is on the person who is asserting that there has been a change in domicile. And the, for domicile to change, there must be an actual 
change of residence to the new locality, plus an intent to remain there. And as Mr. Beckwith has testified, it was not his intent to remain in California. He was visiting and courting and seeing Ms. Um, Fry, and his intent was to return to Tennessee. And so, and so the so the FTB has failed to meet its burden of proving that there was a change of domicile. Secondly, the you know although the Klemp case dealt with and the Corbett case dealt with people who were visiting California for, for as quote seasonal visitors end quote the result is that the court looked at what was that whether their stay was temporary and transitory and how that since the stay was stays were temporary and transitory that the taxpayers were not residents of California. And in the Klemp case, which involved a period of six years, in, in several of those years, the Klemps were in California 186 days um, compared to 21 days in Illinois, 159 days compared to 33 days in Illinois, and 171 days in California compared to 25 days in Illinois. So, you know, the fact that Mr. Beckwith from mid-March on to through the, was in California more than he was in Tennessee is not sufficient to establish residence. And as Mr. Beckwith has testified, if the deal would not go through, he would have had to remain in Tennessee. And the deal was not a sure thing. It was certain, it was not certain that the deal would close until it actually closed. And I think that about wraps it up for me, Your Honor. But basically, in summation, we believe that the FTB has failed to show that there was a change of domicile. And in fact, there was no question here. The issue presented to the court was just whether he was a resident. There was no claim that he had changed his domicile and no argument by the FTB um, that the domicile was changed to California. It's basically been their argument that he was a resident of California because of the time he spent here. Um, and I believe the evidence shows that he was here for transitory and temporary purposes and that he intended to go back to and did periodically go back to Tennessee and intended if the deal did not go through, he would not move permanently to California and become a resident. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Mr. Horowitz. Yes, Ms. Sater, Ms., uh, Mr. Hostel, do you have any closing statements you'd like to make before Mr. Horowitz gets a final? Yes, statement? I do. Yes, I do. All right, uh, go uh, ahead. Uh, a couple things I want to clarify first, you know, Kylie also received and Mr. Beckworth or, Be or, Be or Beckwith testified that he was paying for her monthly car payment on that Volkswagen and was also paying for the car registration and things and like that. So the, the list of benefits that, 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 that Kylie had received from Mr. Beckwith far exceeded what uh, Mr. Horowitz had represented. The second thing is, and, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't ask him the question, but it appears that Mr. Beckwith just found out recently that he would have had been asked to remain in, in Tennessee had the deal um, um, uh, not closed, as opposed to having a sense as the deal was going through that that would be the case. I, I thought that was very in, 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 in enlightening at the last moment, but I just wanted to clarify the, the, those two things. Anyway, um, what did Mr. Beckwith do prior to the sale of Eco Energy? He first assumed the obligation of the Gray Street apartment, and then he bought a house in California, the West Fifth Street apartment. He sold his house in Tennessee. Starting in May 2012, he spent significantly more time in California than he spent in Tennessee. He sold his personal items in Tennessee. He returned his firearm to a Tennessee gun shop. He bought personal items in California. He shipped the one car without an expiring lease to California. And when not on vacation, he lived first in the apartment he paid for, and then his California abode with his fiance. 
and all the departures and returns from the vacations all started and ended in California. Further, he stopped providing services to Eco Energy and to Eco Energy in Tennessee, and he didn't re enter Tennessee except to close the Eco Energy sale. Of all the documents, two are probably the most telling. One we talked about just briefly, and that's document number 160, and that's the uh, five, uh, the uh, the um, 540 uh, NRCA. Um, you know, not only did, did 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 he not include any any income on that form, but if you look at the part that says the days you spent in California, he put NA. Um, uh, he 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 didn't answer. It, it, it could be consistent with what's reflected in probably the second most the, 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 the significant document, and that's 2767. Last night when I went to bed, it was like Queen's Gambit. I saw the the uh, the, uh, the physical presence sheet on the uh, on the bed, but this, the physical presence sheet um, that everybody admits to uh, and is conceded to be truthful um, um, is 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 very detailed. I want to talk a little bit about the testimony that happened over the last. The, the, the few days, um, you know, we got from, you know, in regard to, to Gray Street, we found out that from April 16th to April 30th, uh, appellate and lived in Gray Street for 12 days, 24 days in May, 23 days in June, 27 in July, 22 in August, and significantly, he paid 100% of the rent for May, June, July, and August. He essentially went from his last night at Gray Street to his first night at West Fifth Street in consecutive days. Um, this is not both in physical presence and payments of expenses, the evidence of a, of a guest. With regards to West Fifth, you know, Appellate's argument is somewhat perplexing to, to me because it's undisputed that from September 1st through December 19th, that that West Fifth Street home was Appellate's home while in California. It was, it was also the place Appellant left and returned to when he went to California. Though arguably not perfect, it's clear that the work was substantially completed by September 1st. Payments to the end of August matched the invoice. And as, Compella, as Appellant conceded, no permits were required as the work was cosmetic. The fact that he put a glass door on his pool house in January doesn't tell us much about the, the, uh, the, uh, the the condition of the home for occupancy in starting in September. Um, Mr. Beckworth owned Fifth Street. He occupied Fifth Street. He paid the bills at, 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 at West Fifth Street. And after his relationship with Miss Fry fractured, it was Miss Frey who left, who left, and appellate paid her $14,000 to settle into a new apartment. She was the guest of West Fifth Street. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Eco Energy Copper Suco deal and what Mr. Cohn said yesterday. I can't emphasize enough that Mr. Cohn was a pellet's witness, right? And much of what Mr. Horwith argued earlier contradicts with, with, with what Mr. Cohn said. Um, what Mr. Cohn said very, very clearly is that absent a catastrophic event like a fire, um, which still may not change things, the deal was essentially a done deal by November 1st. He said that due diligence in the project started in early summer and was substantially, if not completely finished, about November 1st, 2012, even with the reliance companies. I asked him on, on, on redirect or, or recross specifically that question, and he said that the reliance cut the companies and the, and the agreements with them were either completed before or soon after and November 1st. Uh, Mr. Cohen also stated that Eco Energy had a pre-existing relationship with Copper Sucre and knew each other's business well, very well, before November 1st. In fact, Mr. Cohen, and I think this is very telling, he testified that soon after November 1st, both Copper Sucre and Eco Energy sent out press re releases announcing the deals. Right? Companies like this do not send press releases unless it's essentially a done deal. In fact, Mr. Cohn even said this would be very, very, very embarrassing to both companies if, for whatever reason, the deal, the, the deal eventually the, the, the fell through. Based on the, on the, um, on the press releases, um, uh, the news was picked up by journals and magazines and, and reported you know, appropriately. 
Um, and then while Mr. Beckwith denied the existence that, of, of the fact that the ethanol tariff had essentially expired, Ms. Cohen stated that, that it had not, and when it, it was one of the key factors behind the deal from Cooper Sucre's per day perspective. Um, Mr. Cohen also acknowledged that both Larry and David Beckworth or Be or Beckwith resigned at their positions in early 2012, and that David was no longer involved in the day-to-day decision-making makings. Importantly, and this is very important, both Mr. Beckwith and his brother were replaced, right? They were replaced by other employees. Other employees were hired to take their role in that company. Uh, Mr. Cohen also said that both parties were eager to get the deal done, they cooperated, uh, and they worked to have it finalized. In fact, the deal, as Mr. Cohen uh, admitted, uh, finalized some eight, eight days before they, they had hoped. Uh, he said that neither Copper Sucre or uh, Eco Energy provided any false misrepresentations, um, and neither party um, um, invoked any notice through procedure. Um, in the end, he confirmed um, and said that it was essentially a done deal on, 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 on November 1st. Mr. Walker, you know, today, you know, he's a friend of, 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 of Mr. Beckwith's, and I think we have to keep that, 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 that in mind. But he was confused. Maybe it happened in 2011, maybe it happened in 2012. The one thing he did know is that it was tied to Mr. Beckwith's brother's divorce. And we know from the record that that divorce finalized in November 2011. Um, in his declaration, he said it finalized in 2012, and that might be why everything is kind of off by a year. But it was very clear that he couldn't provide any persuasive testimony one way or another, whether or not the events happened in 2011 or 2012. But we do know that by May 2012, another entity took that property and was converting it over to, um, to another the, 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 the restaurant. We also know that the talks about the restaurant project had not progressed to the point when they had gotten any commitments from, um, from anyone um, uh, when they asked about it. In fact, Mr. Walker himself did not um, um, inquire whether or not he was even allowed to enter this partnership based on his partnership with, with M Street. Um, you know, when we look at the Nashville properties, um, you know, we have, uh, uh, um, you know, M Mr. Beckwith admitted that when it came to looking at properties, um, uh, that that occurred in the second or third quarter um, um, uh, 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 was, um, um, excuse me, was, uh, uh, had he was looking at the properties in the second or third quarter of 2012 with his testimony. And when Mr. Horwith, on um, uh, tried to get him back into thinking about October, he said, no, I'm pretty sure it was second or third quarter of 2012. So that's really outside of our the time frame. With regards to, to, to the mother's house, um, you know, he didn't spend a night in his mother's house. When, and when asked where he, he stayed when he returned to Tennessee, he, say, he said he stayed at his brother's house. Um, what, while he may have received his bills at his mother's house, we know from his testimony that those bills were paid from his computer in California. And it's also important to note the mail was also received at West Fifth and at his, and at his prior, prior the residence. Um, and then just one last thing, when we're talking about the support payments paid to his uh, ex-wife, uh, that is just you know, a connection. It's not a major factor or anything, but it is a connection he had with, with, with California. Um, um, these are the facts, and these facts are consistent with the finding that Mr. Beckworth was both a California resident and California domiciliary during the relevant time. On December 19, 2012, Mr. Beckworth was inside California for other than a temporary transitory purpose. He entered California well before the Eco Energy sale and never looked back. Mr. Beckworth is a California resident under California Revenue and Tax Code Section 17014A1. Likewise, Mr. Beckworth was also domiciled in California and either outside of California for a few days in order to close the sale of Eco Energy, or on vacation in either Las Vegas, Arizona, or Mexico. Accordingly, Mr. Beckworth, when absent from California, was absent for a temporary purpose. Likewise, Mr. Beckworth is a California resident under California Revenue and Tax Code Section 17014A2 as well. 
I thank you for your time. Uh, I know it's been a, a long day um, and um, I don't know if there's any additional questions, but I'd be happy to, you know, to answer anything that you all may have. Thank you, Mr. Hostel. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, you have five minutes for a final statement. Okay, I just want to clarify some points. Um, thank, thank you, Your Honor. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, I want to clarify some points. Um, I think there were inadvertent misstatements possibly by Mr. Hofstadt concerning Mr. Khan's testimony. My notes reflect that Mr. Khan, although Mr. Khan said it would be embarrassing for the companies if the deal fell through given the press releases, he also said that um, Echo Energy wanted the deal done, but he couldn't speak for Koper Sucre, um, that Koper Sucre could not be forced to close the deal, and that the there were cert if certain events could have occurred outside of Echo Energy and Koper Sucre's reach, which could have been a material adverse effect. And he agreed with me that a fire at either the gasoline terminal or the ethanol terminal in North Carolina could have been a material adverse effect. Um, and also another thing that Mr. Hofstadt and Ms. Mercado do not address is whether in fact Mr. Beckwith changed his domicile. And they have not proven that Mr. Beckwith changed his domicile prior to after the sale to Coper Scooker was closed. It requires not only physical presence, but an intent to remain and not return to your prior place. And Mr. Beckwith has testified that he intended to return to Tennessee and would not have move permanently to California if the deal did not close and its closing was not a certainty until it closed. And I have nothing further if the panel has any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Horowitz. I'll just double check really quick. Judge, right now, you have any questions before we close? Uh, this is Judge Reidenauer, and I do not have any questions, but I do want to thank everybody for their time today and yesterday. Thank you. Judge Lambert, do you have any questions? This is Judge Lambert. Um, I have no uh, further questions, and uh, yeah, I want to also thank everyone uh, and for the witnesses giving their testimony. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have the testimony and we have your arguments. We are ready to submit the case. The record is now closed. This concludes the hearing and the judges will meet to decide the case based on everything that was presented. Um, we will aim to send both parties our written decision no later than 100 days from today. The next hearing will be this afternoon at 1 p.m. I again want to thank everybody for their time and patience. Um, I know this was a long and complicated hearing and everybody did a really good job. Um, I want, hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. Thanks Thank again. you, Your Honor. Bye.